welcome everybody to both sides of the conversation. I'm John Henry, executive director. Today is Sunday. So you know what that means. We're going to have another Sunday conversation. This is a very important conversation um, today. Um, we're going to be talking about surveillance in our community, a very, very important topic. Um, you know, the more cameras, the more problems we understand it. We see all this stuff that's going on. I think today's uh, conversation is going to be the kickoff to wake up the community about what's going on and how these cameras is going to impact our community. Today, Sister Ayo is out. We want to give up prayers to her family. Again, community, there's so much stuff going um, in and happening in the community and around the world. And it's just always important that, uh, you know, we just stay connected, stay connected to our health, our mental health. Folks are going through stuff all over this country, across the world right now. Uh, I was talking to a minister last night and and she said it perfectly. We're not in our last days. We're in our last hours, the way things is happening around here. So we got to stay uh, focused, stay intentional, and uh, just continue to love and support each other. So excited today for today's show. Uh, my brother Mark is here. So, you know, I'm excited about that, man. It was some phenomenal, phenomenal um, events this weekend that I was able to partake in. Um, you know, we had Director Davis' birthday. Just want to say again, happy birthday to her. Just amazing, uh, powerful sisters. Just, you know, it's so much good happening. I mean, it's always sad when we hear all of the negative stuff that's taking place because we got some phenomenal folks uh, doing some amazing, amazing stuff. Also, I want to give a huge shout out to DM Racing to my niece, okay? She is the first black woman to be drag racing 225 miles by this girl be moving down the track um but again um it was just great to be able to make it up there and support her yesterday um again we have some black excellence that is happening um around this country uh we're we, we're, we're making history y'all we still moving forward and that's why i always tell people the, the needle is still moving um in this country and things are starting uh to happen and, and as we step into 2024 uh, we hope more doors open, more opportunities, more of uh, folks in our community taking the lead and breaking some of these barriers. The ceiling is getting lower. OK, we, we, we're breaking the ceiling in a lot of areas. we got a lot of work to do, uh, but we are we are definitely making impact and change in the community. And then lastly, want to give a huge shout out uh, to New Beginnings, a phenomenal organization. I was able to go down in San Jose um, on Saturday and help. Of some of the unhoused folks and folks who are in need. Again, our families, our communities are being impacted economically. Um, so again, when you have uh, foundations and you have organizations um, bringing those supplies and must needed food and things to help out our elders and the people in the community is always a great thing. Um, so just want to give them some acknowledgement and shout out. Y'all know me. I keep telling y'all both sides of the conversation. We will go with our black and brown community. We will help out. Uh, we're not just going to talk about it. And um, it was a great event. And it's just amazing to see the impact um, that they're doing in the South Bay, helping our um, br uh, brown folks down there and making sure that uh, community elders um, get the much needed food and support that they need. I don't know if y'all paying attention, but the cost of food is going out of this roof. OK, I went to the grocery store and I said, oh, my goodness. I mean, it is expensive. And, um, you know, with all of these strikes and raises and things happening, um, People are just like, what do we do? Um, you know, the unions are fighting for higher wages. And every time we get raise increase, the food, everything just goes up. Um, so I don't know where it's going, but um, we're in some definitely some challenging times. So um, just want to say community, keep your head up. we got a lot of work to do. We'll keep fighting through it. But with that being said, Brother Mark, the voice is here. Welcome to the show today, brother. Holla at the people and let them know what's going on. How you feeling, brother? Well, first of all, Bishop, as always, man, so grateful to be here. Uh, love both sides of the conversation and the family that I have here. Um, community, much love. Uh, as always, man, I kind of sit in my own uh, world sometimes just meditating, looking at the news, what's going on around the world, looking at what's going on around the nation. Uh, I think one of the things I was reminded of here is I got a chance to sit with my baby girl. My daughter came down from college, stopped by and saw old man this weekend. And we just got a chance to talk for a little bit while she was making her rounds. But one of the things is when I'm reminded when we talk about community is sometimes we forget the power that we have with the five to ten people that we touch on a daily basis and how important it is to just check on each other because when something happens or goes down, it's not what's happening in, around the world. It's what's happening right next door. 
in your house with the people that you're touching every day. So I just want to remind the community, don't lose heart. I know things are going uh, tough for a lot of us, but we still have that 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 life force, that 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 sense of encouragement, even if it's just a kind word you can give to the person that's next to you. That is the most powerful thing that we have. So, man, um, looking forward to a good conversation, Bishop. Man, definitely. Well, with that being said, since I was not here, I'll take over the news. There's some new news that's going on out there um, as things is changing. I want to start off and just say um, in California, the first um, person that's been convicted of fentanyl overdose, they have charged with murder in our state. The guy was sentenced on Friday, 15 years to life as the federal government. Folks are taking a stance against this fentanyl use. And I think with the harsher penalties that they're trying to put out, anybody um, who lose their life, those dealers are getting um, a murder charge. Uh, we'll see if this ease uh, the folks who are willing and dealing with fentanyl in the community. So we'll see how that goes and we'll keep an eye on it. But I guess they're trying to uh, pump up the pressure and the district attorney was able to get that first conviction and we'll see how it plays out um, over the next couple of months and into this election year, we know the election time is coming. Everything is intensifying out here. So we'll, we will see. Also, bleaking uh, shuttles from West Bank to Iraq, trying to contain the fallout between Israel and Hamas war. The U.S. Secretary of State um, took his diplomatic push um, on Friday um, to try to ease tension with this uh, Israel-Hamas war as we are seeing more and more protests across the Bay Area and beyond, okay? People are asking for ceasefire stop. So many tragic lives um, being lost. Um, some of the attacks that took place this, this weekend was just unbearable to watch to see the amount of young kids and children um, who are being impacted by this war. War is ugly, and uh, we need to find a way uh, to find a way to get out of this. This is just terrible to see the amount of harm, trauma and, and and just things that's happening to those young folks over there. But again, we'll keep everybody up to date. We know this is the thing in the headlines taking over, but uh, again, just continue to pray for those folks um, because it is definitely terrible, terrible times. Also, believe it or not, Trump leads in five critical states as voters blast blighted Biden times polls find um, the voter battlegrounds in the states are saying they trust uh, Donald Trump over President Biden. More and more folks are jumping on the Trump train community. I keep telling you, I don't know what's going on. There's something going on in the Democratic Party. They still, they're not trying to pass on the power. And more and more people, I'm telling you, they're backing out. They'd rather deal with the worst of the worst uh, than play politics. I don't know. We'll see what the voters come up with this year as folks are, uh, as we step into 2024 and more and more folks are getting involved. We know the um, commercial ads and all the stuff will be coming out. But I think folks is, is, is at a standstill and um, they don't know which way uh, things is going to go. Um, so we'll see. But Trump is leading. OK, for all the folks are saying whatever they want to say, Trump is leading. Y'all Y'all better be careful. Trump is leading. But I um, wanted to also um, talk about one of the things um, this week um, on Wednesday, um, both Senate and House was able to pass a $14 billion uh, package to help aid Israel. And I want to say this, community, because I've been talking about where's the reparations at? Where, what's going on? I'm telling y'all where our reparations is going, okay? They go into all of these wars across the seas in Europe, Ukraine and, and Israel. And, um, you know, I just have to say this because I, I, I get mad. And I always tell y'all I hate the way politics play amongst people. You know, uh, we were talking about the government shutdown a month ago. And, you know, it was all this fighting to get a bill resolved to, to, to avoid another shutdown. But isn't it funny how easy both sides could come together to package up $14 billion to send to another country? Community, pay attention to what's going on, okay? When they talk about all this stuff that y'all, I don't know. I'm just telling y'all, pay attention. I was just watching the news this weekend. $115 billion in aid has been sent to Ukraine. I don't know. But when black folks ask for reparations, we keep hearing to talk about reparations. Everybody keeps saying, well, who's going to pay for it? How are they going to pay for this? All I know is, okay, Republican Party, okay, and the Democratic Party was able to come together to give $115 billion to Ukraine, okay? Another $14 billion for this Israel war, okay? So when people get to talking to me about 
who's going to pay for reparations? The same people that approved all that. That's all I'm saying, community. We're going to move on. But I had to put that out there because I be trying to tell people, man, don't let these people fool you with their rhetoric, okay? We could come together and spend money on what we want to in this country. It just ain't black folks. I hope y'all understand that. All right. A man suspect, suspected of decapitating a woman and hiding the head was found in San Francisco. A barrier a suspect of killing a woman and hiding her head has been found in San Francisco. Officials said on Tuesday, uh, the, the man was, um, the incident happened in Santa Rosa and the guy was uh, arrested in San Francisco. 24 year old man um, is, is terrible. You know, I mean, we, we have some things. We got bodies in suitcases fly, fly, floating around Lake Merritt. We got people chopping heads off. I, I don't know what's going on. I keep telling y'all. There's a volcano that's about to erupt in this country. We got some scary things to watch out for. I don't know where we headed, but it's not looking so good. As the pastor told me yesterday, uh, Rev, the voice, she said, Brother Henry, we're not in our last days. We're in our last hours. Every time I look at the news, it's more gruesome, more things happen. I'll just sit here and say, when is that hour going to hit before everything erupt? But, um, Unfortunate stuff happened in the news, but that's what's going on locally and around the Bay, and around the globe. Brother Mark, you can take over the events, brother. Bishop, I don't know how to follow that up, but I'm going to pull out some of the more positive things that are going on in and around the community. So let's go ahead and get into the event. Big Bucks Racing is presenting the final 1-8 mile Bucks race at Sacramento Raceway. This is an all weekend event from November 3rd through the November the 5th. Race fees will be collected at the front gate. For more info, see the link below. And HCV Section 8 Lottery Waitlist Opening closes November 6, 2023 at 5 p.m. Applications that are not submitted by 5 p.m. will not be processed. Apply online at the link below. And the Latino Task Force is providing Section 8 housing waitlist application assistance November 6th at the LTF Mission Hub at 701 Alhambra Street in San Francisco from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Murray's Athletic Development Excellence Foundation presents their interactive speaker series on November the 9th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Lincoln High School, located at 2162 24th Street in San Francisco. For more info, see the link below. And both sides of the conversation invite you to nominate a Black San Francisco veteran to win a one-hour personal storytelling session with our team. Please provide name, photo, branch, year served, contact info. And S and their San Francisco neighborhood and the reason for nominating them at the email address below. And Into Action announces the Black Culture Preservation Mini Grants Cycle 2, closing on November the 10th, 2023, for December 1st through February 28th of 2024. To apply, see the links below. And California Lawyers for the Arts presents the Bayview Urban Arts Festival on November 11th from 2 to 6 p.m. at the Bayview Opera House. This is a free community event holding art installations and giveaways. For more info, visit the link below. And the San Francisco Bay Area Theater Company invites you to the third New Roots Theater Festival for six performances over three days. Friday through Sunday, November 10th through the 12th at Brava Theater Center, 2781 24th Street in San Francisco. Live stream options are available. For more info, see the link below. And the African American Shakespeare Company announces its 2023-24 season beginning with Death of a Salesman, Saturday, October 28th, through Sunday, November 12th at the Taub Atrium Theater at 401 Van Nuys Avenue in San Francisco. The four series season subscription also includes Cinderella, Pipeline, and The Merchant of Venice. Purchase tickets for one show or the series at the link below. And San Francisco Recovery Theater presents Reflections in Black 2023 New Roots Theater Festival One Weekend 15 performances, 50 Bay Area artists.
from November 10th through the 12th at Brava Theater in San Francisco. Tickets available at the link below. And Dogs Clubs presents the Dogs Got Your Back Basketball Tournament for boys and girls 3rd through 8th grade. Register your school or club team for $325 and a three-game guarantee. The tournament will be held at the City College of San Francisco. For more info, visit the link below. And join the Rafiki Coalition for Visit the Presidio, Walk the Bay Trail, and Visit the Golden Gate Bridge Visitor Center on November 13th from 9.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. The free shuttle leaves Rafiki, located at 601 Cesar Chavez Street at 9.30 a.m. Free lunch will be provided. For more info, call or text the number below. And the San Francisco Public Health Foundation, in collaboration with the San Francisco Department of Public Health, is requesting RFPs for the SDDT 2024 Healthy Community Support Grants. Apply now through November 16th. For more info, follow the link below. The Fall 2023 Community Creatives Workshop welcomes you to a free family fun event on November 18th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Pelega Recreation Center, located at 500 Felton Street in San Francisco. Participants can learn or improve a new skill. With any of our specialized workshops, topics, sewing, hair braiding, self-defense, and beading and jewelry workshops, and enjoy free food and prizes. For more info, register at the link below. And Fathers to Founders presents the Black is Beautiful Health Resort on November 18th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. at in the Tenderloin. We are seeking service providers, screeners, testers, and educators. For more info, see the number in the link below. And the AAACC asks you to join them for the Celebrate Black Music event. Save the date, Saturday, November 18th. Info at the link below. Sisters Small Business Saturday host holiday gift shopping on November 25th from 1 to 5 p.m. at In the Black, 1567 Fillmore Street, San Francisco. To register, visit the link below. And visit the Farmer's Market located at the Southeast Community Center at 1550 Evans Avenue in San Francisco every Thursday now through November 30th from 3 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. They accept cash, debit, and EBT. Mackey's Corner presents Mackey's Corner Christmas on December 3rd for, from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. There will be food, dance, a Black Santa, and presents. This event is to celebrate those who have been impacted by suicide. Must register to attend. And the San Francisco NAACP celebrates 95 years of service at the annual Freedom Fund Gala, December the 1st, at the Hyatt Regency Grand Ballroom located at 5 Impercario Center in San Francisco. Single tickets are $150 and tables of 10 are $1,500. Register at the link or number below. And the Black Female Project is hosting Invest in You, a transformative leadership program December the 1st and 2nd via Zoom with Charmaine McClare. Use coupon code WINNING2023 for $1,000 off. Register at the link below. And the OMI Cultural Participation Projects, The Lion King. Friday, December 8th at 7.30 p.m. at the Orpheum Theater at 1192 Market Street in San Francisco. For more information, visit the link below. Walters Wellness Group invites you to the Restorative Retreat on December 9th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. for a one-day retreat where a team of expert facilitators led by Dr. Kathea Walters will guide you through a transformational experience designed to help you get into your body and quiet your mind. For more info and to register, see the link below. Dogs Club presents 
a holiday hoops basketball tournament for boys and girls third to eighth grade. Register your school or club team for $325 with a three-game guarantee. The tournament will be held at the City College of San Francisco. For more info, visit the link below. And the San Francisco African American Reparations Advisory Committee cordially invites you to be a part of the conversation every second Monday of 2023. You may attend in person at City Hall, located at 1 Dr. Carlton B. Goodlett Place, or online by registering at the link below. And Dreamkeeper SF invites you to join us for community updates every third Wednesday in 2023. These meetings are open to the public via Zoom. For more info and the meeting link, please visit the site below. And as part of their fall exhibitions, the St. Joseph's Art Society features works by visual artist Christopher Birch in traversing on geographies of blade and bone now through Friday, December 15th at 1401 Howard Street in San Francisco. For info, follow the link below. And Wu Yi presents the Holiday Pajama Jam for the Bottles and Blanket Pantry on Saturday, December 16th from 1 to 4 p.m. at 4900 3rd Street in San Francisco. And come out for the Lorraine Hansberry Theater's 2023-24 season. The season starts with a soulful Christmas, a holiday concert with performances Thursday through Sunday, December 14th through the 17th at the Fort Mason Center for Arts and Culture. Tickets are on sale now. And for more info, visit the link below. Register your school's team for FR SAR Academy's Holiday Hoops Basketball Invitational for boys and girls 5th through 8th grade. The tournament starts on December 21st through the 23rd. Located at the St. Ignatius College Prep, 2001 37th Avenue, San Francisco. For more info, visit the link below. OMI Cultural Participation Projects, The Wiz, Saturday, January 27th, 2024, at 7.30 p.m. at the Golden Gate Theater, 1 Taylor Street in San Francisco. And the African American Arts and Culture Complex invites you to the Season of Black Art inaugural event. Introducing the October 2023 through February 2024 season at the AAACC located at 762 Fulton Street, San Francisco on Sunday, 29th, October the 29th, kicking off a captivating celebration of black creativity and culture with special guests and performers. For more info and to register for free tickets, see the link below. And Into Action announces the Black Culture Preservation Mini Grants Cycle Number 3, opening on January 25th and closing on February 26, 2024, for the March 1st through May 31st, 2024 season. You can get up to $9,500 in funding for Black Cultural Preservation events in the Tenderloin, Lakeview, Sunnydale, Visitation Valley, and OMI. To apply, see the link below. And the Dreamkeeper Initiative announces the Senior Home Repair Program with an up to $50,000 forgivable loan to low to moderate income senior and or disabled homeowners residing in historically distressed and underserved neighborhoods in San Francisco. For more info, see the link below. And the SF Human Rights Commission has regular bi-monthly commission meetings on the second and fourth Thursday of each month at 5 p.m. in San Francisco City Hall Room 416. And you can also attend via Zoom. Fathers to Founders hosts child support clinics every Tuesday and Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 232 6th Street. Receive essential guidance on child support debt reduction, resolving driver's license holds, pursuing custody of your children, and establishing visitation rights. For clinic appointments, call the number below. 
Dreamkeeper announces the Down Payment Assistance Loan Program. You could receive up to $500,000 for a down payment assistance and up to $30,000 for closing costs and connected with housing counselors, lenders, and realtors. For info, see the links below. Walters Wellness Group invites you to the SIP Paint Center every first, third, and fifth Friday where you can unwind and set the tone for your weekend. Fueled by tea, creativity, and grounding, hosted by Dr. Kathea Walters, Dr. C, and the Walters Wellness Group. For more info, see the link below. And join Fathers to Founders for Fatherhood Reimagined Therapy group sessions held every Tuesday night from 6 to 7.30 p.m. ongoing, beginning on October the 24th at 232 6th Street in San Francisco. There will be food served at each session. For more info, see the link and the number below. And the APRI is hosting youth workshops offering job referrals, resume building, skill building, internships, professional networking, and community service hours at 1301 Evans Avenue in San Francisco. To schedule a Zoom or phone appointment, see the link or number below. Come out to the Fillmore's Friday Night Market every Friday from 4 to 9 p.m. on O'Farrell Street between Fillmore and Steiner for live music, barbecue, soul food, frozen desserts, retail vendors, games for kids, a dominoes tournament, prizes, and entertainment. Vendor booths are available. Register at the link below. And get your COVID-19 booster and monkeypox antiviral pill treatment. Thursdays, 1 to 5 p.m. at 3.30 Ellis Street, as well as Saturdays, 12 to 4 p.m. at 1221 Mission Street. The Community Living Room, open all day, Monday through Friday, serving breakfast from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and a grab-and-go lunch from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. at City of Hope Cafe, 750 Ellis Street in San Francisco. And the San Francisco Office of Financial Empowerment announces Smart Money Coaching, which provides free, confidential, one-on-one -on -one financial guidance. The program is available to anyone living, working, or receiving services in San Francisco, in English or Spanish, with additional translation services as requested. For more info, see the link and number below. And be a mentor in SFUSD. Join SFUSD school-based mentoring program, Mentoring for Success. Sign up to volunteer as an individual or group mentor district-wide. See the link below. And both sides of the conversation is calling on all conscious individuals and organizations to sponsor our third annual African-American History Bowling Event and Award Ceremony. The award ceremony will be held on February 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. And the bowling event will be hosted on February 25th, 2024 from 2 to 5 p.m. For more info on sponsorship, please see the website and email address below. And both sides of the conversation needs your skill and ability to engage youth. We are looking for community members to participate in basketball and recreational activities and mentor youth on Saturdays at the San Francisco Juvenile Detention Center. Stipends will be paid. For more info, see the link below. And would you like to promote your business, nonprofit, or community impact? Then sign up for our Hidden Gems show. Share your expertise on Educational Thursdays or be a panelist on Sunday Conversation. And keep up with both sides of the conversation's latest shows and community outreach events. Follow us on all social media platforms, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter at bsotc.org. And both sides of the conversation welcomes individuals who are interested in giving back to their community to join us as volunteers. We value the positive impact volunteers can make, and we invite you to be a part of our mission to uplift and support our community. And both sides of the conversation also kindly request 
your invaluable support for our podcast and community engagement endeavors. We cordially invite you to explore any of our donation links as your generous contributions will greatly aid us in enhancing our programming. And we would also like to take this time to acknowledge the Dreamkeeper Initiative for its support of both sides of the conversation's programming. The Dreamkeeper Initiative amplifies the voices of and invests in San Francisco's diverse Black communities to reform public safety and address structural inequities in San Francisco. To learn more, visit www.dreamkeepersf.org. And do we also have upcoming shows? There's Tuesday Hidden Gym on November 7th and next week's Educational Thursday on November the 9th. And with that, Bishop, I will turn it back over to you, my brother. Man, let's go. I know the community is waiting to hear today's conversation. We're going to get ready to bring up our guest today. Just want to say this to the community. Um, I know those are a lot of announcements, okay, but we're trying to do our part to make sure the community hears the resources, what's going on. Um, around the city, around the Bay. Um, again, all community organizations, people that's doing events, you want to get the community aware of what you're doing, please reach out to us, send your flyers, your information to events at bsotc.org, and we'll make sure that we help get your information out to the community. Too many times in our community, folks are saying, I didn't know this was going on. How do I connect with the resource? I don't feel connected, all right? We're trying to make sure the community's connected. Check out what we got going on. Sign up to our newsletter. Again, we are headed into a great month of Sunday conversations as we are headed into a lot of things this month. We got veterans uh, this morning. So I want to give uh, this month, we want to highlight all of our veterans out there and thank you for your service. We'll be having conversations with them. Also, this is Diabetes Awareness Month. We want to make sure that folks are uh, watching what they eat, keeping those diabetes um, under control. As you all know, in the black community, we are hit the hardest with diabetes. And also, this is a special month. This is Men's um, Health Month. And uh, we want to make sure all of the fellas out there, go get checked up. Go see your doctor. Go get your mental health check. We want to encourage the brothers, okay? Too many times black men are dying in this city, in this country. Uh, because we are not doing the preventative work, going to the doctors, being checked, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer is taking our brothers more and more and more and also heart attack. OK, high blood pressure and heart attack is putting a strain on our community. We ain't going to talk about the mental health. We know brothers are suffering. Go get checked up. Go see your doctor. See what's going on, brothers. It's our month. Mental health month. Let's encourage each other to go out there and. Um, you know, keep our health intact. With that being said, we're going to get our guests up here today. We got two phenomenal community folks. See, when we talk about these conversations, we want the community here, what their thought is. And, um, you know, I know it's football day. The Raiders is winning. So everybody's watching right again. Now that we just taking a break. The storm is coming and we, we ready. But with that being said, we're going to bring up our two guests today. We're going to have this conversation. Community, if you are watching out there live, you want to break a comment or you could put your perspective. This is an interactive conversation. Y'all can put y'all comments in a live chat. And we'll answer those questions or put those questions and comments into today's conversation. This is a community conversation, not just for San Francisco, but all over uh, the United States. This surveillance that we're talking about is impacting especially the black and brown community. So we want to make sure this conversation is had. And today we will have it. With that being said, we're going to bring up to the stage Sister Nina Smallwood. What's going on, Queen? Holla at the people. Let them know who you are. Uh, nothing much. Thank you for having me on the show, John Henry. Um, my name is Nina Smallwood. I am a San Francisco native. I've lived, um, I was raised in Ohio, lived in New York. Um, um, excuse me, I got my BA in international criminal justice, and I'm currently pursuing my MBA, MPA in sustainability management. So when John Henry brought this topic to me, you know, I bump into John Henry in my workspace. Um, I do. I recently started working at Collective Impact at Ella Hill Hutch, um, where I help young people um, with job placement, career services, career development and things like that. So, yeah, I'm just. I think she might have froze up. Well, we'll get her back when she get unfrozen. Uh, but Nina, we are happy that you are here. Uh, she has a great um, knowledge and perspective. 
And uh, man, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing um, her speak today. But we'll get her back on as we know Wi-Fi technology. When we start talking about surveillance, they start messing with our surveillance. I don't. Know. <laughs> but we'll 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 get, we'll get her back up. Uh, I see you there. You kind of froze up, but uh, we'll get you back. But we happy to hear you have you here today, and we know uh, you have an amazing perspective, and that's why I wanted you to be a part of this conversation. Um, because I know you you, you have a, a dialogue that's just all over the place that's great for community, too. With that being said, we're going to bring up this brother. He's been here. He knows what's going on. My brother Rico. Y'all know when Rico come here, we get this conversation going to be lit. You know, Rico going to make us think. He going to make us dig deep. See, when you got folks in the community that's thinkers, see, we have to have independent thinkers. And let me tell y'all, Rico got that sauce. I don't care what y'all say. Rico got that sauce. And I know today the conversation is going to open up. Some folks mind when we talk about this surveillance. Rico, welcome back. You are both sides of the conversation. How no, about the sure. people, Rico? No, for, for sure, for sure. What's up, John? What's up, Mark? How you doing, Nina? Uh, I'm Rico. Uh, Y'all know, born and raised here in San Francisco, a native um, to the entire city. I've been doing the work for 22 years now. Uh, super happy to be giving back to the community. I have my own um, business that I have now, which is uh, I'm the CEO of Black Community Equity Group. We're an equity firm that helps nonprofits and corporate companies to find equity within their organizations and showing them to create equitable structures to bring people of color within their uh, their their organization or businesses. Um, also, I'm on the San Francisco Reparation Advisory Committee and then do a bunch of other stuff with John Henry and, and a whole host of other people. Uh, but I'm happy to uh, be a part of this conversation because it's definitely um, it's just it's that time because uh, what we don't do today is going to hurt us in the, in, in the future. So so these are this is one of those conversations that we got to have right now so that we don't be blindsided later. Man, definitely. Rick, Rick, happy to have you back. Looking forward. We got some things we're talking about working on and I'm excited. Community Rico's always thinking about how to impact black folks. And that's what it's all about. How do we impact our community? And uh, Rico is another one, got a great perspective and all that. But before we get started, community for just for all y'all just tuning on, maybe you don't understand what's going on. Today's conversation, I'm going to have Brother Mark go ahead and give y'all the introduction and the stats as we're talking about more cameras, more problems, video surveillance, and how it impacts black community and also in San Francisco as well. Again, we know there's some things that we got to really talk about this surveillance uh, and the, some of the surveillance program that's happening. But Brother Mark, give the community a little a foundation of today's conversation, then we're going to open it up and get this thing popping. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Through the violent birth of the U.S., produced racially biased government monitoring from its very start. It wasn't until 1956 that the counterintelligence program of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was created. And through that program, federal and local law enforcement used wiretaps and other methods to unlawfully harass, defame, detain, and even frame black activists. While the FBI claimed to have ended the program in 1971, the extrajudicial targeting of black activists by federal and local law enforcement continues to this day. And despite the reemergence of violent white nationalism as the nation's number one threat to domestic security, federal and local government surveillance continued to target black communities. Recent FBI leaks revealed that the FBI continues to target black activists through fabricated designation of black identity extremists, now renamed as the violent racial extremism. And while the vast web of surveillance spreading throughout the U.S. impacts everyone, the harm to targeted groups, including black, Latinx, Arab, Muslim, South Asian, Middle Eastern and migrant communities, disabled people, low and no income, homeless or precariously housed people, are any more receiving government benefits or using public services, include health care, housing and schools, people involved in the sex trades and other criminalized economies, people who may be seeking self-managed abortion and other forms of health care and activists who challenge state and corporate power is grossly disproportionate. Surveillance is increasingly being proposed as an alternative to incarceration and corporations are increasingly profiting from our data now just a couple of stats here black americans are subjected to nearly 25 percent of surveillance despite making up only 13 percent of the u.s population and using demographic information from clusters of neighborhoods developed by the district's office of planning CNS found that the average majority white area had fewer than three cameras 
while the average majority non-white area had more than seven. Now, I could go down the list. There's enough stats there and information to kind of kick off this conversation. Bishop, let me turn it over because I know we've got some interesting points to make on this. Man, definitely. I mean, this conversation is important. And as you stated, you know, black community, these surveillance program are heavily um, impacted when we talk about the surveillance. And and, and the biggest thing um, that you talked about, Mark, is the data, you know, and I know a lot of folks in our community really don't understand data and how a lot of this technology work. Um, but it's very important for us to understand. And I know in San Francisco, uh, the city supervisors and the city uh, voted against uh, facial recognition for police use in San Francisco um, for you know criminal charges and things of that nature. But we also understand um, that that facial recognition and some of those tactics and tools that they're using are still funneling information uh, to the feds and different other um, places that we don't even know uh, what they're doing um, with this. They just can't use it for the criminal stuff. But but there's an issue um, when it comes to private and public um, video surveillance in our community, um, the importance of oversight and accountability. And the reason why this conversation um, is so touchy to me is because um, there's so many things that could take place with surveillance. We're talking about, we know black folks have been wrongfully charged in criminal cases over the years. We've known um, how surveillance has impacted activism, you know, um, and then we see globally what's going on in the world. You know, you look at China, okay, they surveillance, they hold every city, every part of it, and they have um, social. Um, credit. You know what I mean, Mark? So they, he, you got to have social credit to, to fly on planes and different things of that nature. And it, it's, it's, it's a, a digital, of, it's a digital form of redlining. I mean, no, definitely. So, so they're, they're using it to, to divide and segregate us. And, and again, my question is understanding what we're up against, what we going to do about it. Yeah. Now we got to get busy. So with that being said, we're going to open up the conversation and uh, Nina and Rico, y'all can kick it off. The first question is, you know, we talk about black communities and how they subject to um, the disproportionate levels of government surveillance. Um, you know, when we talk about accountability and oversight, I just want to hear from y'all just as regular people in our community. How do y'all feel about the surveillance? Because I think some people not even talking about it. We just walk around our community. Oh, it's cameras up there, but we don't even know. It's not even labeled. Um, and that's something else that we got to talk about today. Um, but but Nina or Rico, I want to open it up. You know, what, what do y'all think uh, about this surveillance? How you feel it impacts you? I know there's a positive side of surveillance. There's a negative side of it. But how do you all feel as community folks and why it's so important for us to have this conversation now and get community activated to start making some real pushes for accountability and oversight? Let's see. Um, I got a lot of thoughts. I got a lot of thoughts about, um, you know, surveillance, but a person's right to surveillance in public is expectant, right? People have an expectant right to privacy. It is not, and that's where the law stands, but it is interesting to see that public people or private companies have started to install cameras around the city and things like that, but it's no different from small businesses having cameras all on their buildings. So for me, it's not that I feel so much about the surveillance or about it, because I just assume that I'm being filmed everywhere. And especially now that everyone has put social media, we willingly have given people our data for free. <laughs> and so now it's like, what do we do with it now that it's out there? Um, the city being more specific to what's happening in this city. I mean, where we live in black communities, they say we are in higher crime areas. So of course they use it to justify why there's more cameras. So my um, issue isn't so much that we're, you know, surveyed because I just assume everybody's big brother is always watching, um, like in that sense. And I also am mindful that if we open this door in that regard, do the police then come back and say, we don't have a right to film them? So I, I just put that out there to be mindful of the things that we kind of think about where they could go with this. So I, I got to jump in there because I already got to push back. See, this is- I this know is, you do. I'm not waiting for it. I know I gotta you do. I got to push back. I, I got to push back. So I, one of the things I got to push back on, it, and, and you know, it was brought up to me about private um, entities. 
Um, you know, and my my here's my issue. I don't care if it's private or public. OK, the minute your cameras is watching people walking down the public streets. See, because when you say private to me, I'm saying, hey, I have a building or I have a dwelling and I'm surveillance in that dwelling. Right. If that's what you want to do for your private surveillance, that's fine. But the minute a private entity, a corporation decides, hey, I want to make my cameras watch people in the community and surveillance the community. That's a problem. There's a disclosure that needs to happen. Because I need to know what are you, what is your investment in watching my people, watching my community, watching my house, me. I want to know if somebody got a camera on my granddaughter in my house, in my streets. I want to know why. Why are you watching and what are you watching for? So that's my only pushback with the private thing. Also, if you are going to be uh, doing private surveillance or even for public city, city surveillance, there has to be notice to my community. OK, I want to see signs up. OK, the law, the ordinance already says it's supposed to have five different languages. It is supposed to be notified where these cameras are, that you're recording who's who's in custody of that information. When we talk about data. Right. Yeah, we have our cell phones and that's certain data and things of that nature. But when you start talking about data on a larger scale, when we talk about what's going on with human trafficking, when we talk about how our community folks are being impacted by CPS and different things of that nature, that they're using this data and technology to cause harm to our community, that's a red flag. And we got to pay attention to that because they're not just using it to say, oh, well, you like to shop at this store. Um, they're using things to say, oh, this person has their kids outside over at, at nine o'clock. Maybe we should have a CPS come over there and check them out. Oh, Inside of our housing complex, we see that there's somebody doing braiding. They braiding hair inside of there. Or there's a barber cutting hair in there, and he doesn't have a license. Or he, so now we're going to go harass him and send our business folks or the folks, city departments to come down there and find out why they haven't signed up. I mean, you get what I'm saying, where I'm going with this? There's a lot of other things um, that is attached to that. And then when we talk about crime, yes, we know that uh, across our city in San Francisco, and I know across this country, uh, we have issues with robbery, violence, and things of that nature. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not so convinced. We have these surveillance cameras, and I'm going to just tell you, it seems like when major things happen, we, we get the surveillance. But what about the day-to-day -day things that are happening in our community? And um, what are they doing about those crimes? There's so many unsolved murders. I'm just saying that we got all this surveillance. They see everything, but they can't see the people doing the crime. But see, I think there's a two-part to this, because I was reading this article in Hayward, okay? They was holding, it was a homicide that happened in, in, in Hayward, and family was asking for the video. They was trying to do all this investigation. They could never get the footage. Well, once they finally got forced to get the footage, they found out it was a Hayward or, or San Leandro police officer who shot and killed that person. So yeah, we got to talk about that, right? And then when we talk about private surveillance, okay, and versus public. See, in San Francisco and across the country, there's a certain protocol that police officers have to do to request footage from a city uh, entity to get that footage. Now, when you have private entities serving as a back door for the police, okay, where they don't have to go through the city process to mark down who's requesting this information and all of that, it starts to make me want to, you know, I'm scratching my head. I want to know what's going on, right? Because if the city has this strenuous process, you know, to get the, the muni cameras, to get the city cameras that the city have up there, you know, there's a process you got to go through. It's very strenuous to get that footage, right? But when you have these nonprofits, when you have these entities, these private entities who are in the interest of law enforcement and other entities, and we're giving them easy access to surveillance without going through that rigorous process of the city, I start to want to scratch my head. And I want to know why. Then when we ask these people the question of, well, how many times have the police officers requested this footage? How many requests have they put in there? Because they famous, these private entities to say, oh, we're, we're not surveillance in people. Uh, we, we don't have people watching these cameras 24-7. Okay, y'all, y'all don't have to worry. They're just recorded. I, listen, if you could go back in two weeks and pull a footage from an incident or something that take place, that's surveillance. Okay, it doesn't matter if you got employees sitting there watching the cameras 24-7. If those cameras are live and they are recording 24-7, that is surveillance. And if, at that point, when you're putting that in our communities, we have a right as community folks, taxpayers to know how many cameras are they? Where are they located at? Are all of the cameras labeled properly stating that they're monitoring and who's in charge of them? And we have the right to have the data. 
Because again, if private entities are saying, hey, we're putting these up on our businesses just in case we get robbed and we go give this to uh, the police department for investigation, as community, we have a right to know how many requests from law enforcement monthly are being used, especially in these hot areas that we know is high crime. How many times are they requesting this information? Because we don't have oversight because we don't have community involvement. We don't know. They're just telling us, oh, we don't have nobody watching it. We're not surveilling. We don't uh, know. Uh, they be, they John Henry, you they know what? Question. I want to hear what Rico got to say. because <laughs> I get, I got a couple of things I want to say to you. You know Please. I do. But I'm going to definitely let Mr. Rico jump in because you brought up a couple of issues. You brought up like four different issues in that. But I'm Go ahead, Rico. But that's what my concern is. Come on, big brother Rico. Talk no, to for us. sure. I, I have a bunch of issues, and it's disheartening that that we are at this point. Um, eight years ago, uh, when public housing uh, in San Francisco transitioned over to RAD, and it was a huge fight. I mean, we we fought, and it was a bunch of us who was in the fight. Um, we wish we would we would have had more community members out there to actually fight because when we were under public housing, we actually had more. Uh, power as a community to actually dictate what we wanted. Uh, but when it went private and you get all these McCormick Barons and these different private companies, it changed the whole narrative for our community. A lot of people actually got pushed out within the last eight years. And then also they were able to do pretty much what they wanted. Uh, when it comes to those cameras, um, my biggest fear is the, is the great bamboozle. Um, we, we're bamboozled a lot. And, and, you know, especially when it comes to violence and racism. Uh, when it comes to violence, our 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 elders uh, kind of yield to authority without thinking about the cause and effect of what things can actually and how things can actually happen. Um, as we look at California as a state, there's a lot of things that's happening as it relates to mass incarceration. As they're lowering the state prison levels and the, and the county jail levels, the federal prison levels are rising even higher. So, John, I, I, I agree with you as it relates to those cameras and how they are saying that they're not watching them. But I do believe that they use a lot of that to collect a lot of evidence on these young people to create RICO law, RICO uh, acts against them. Um, and I, and I, I just I think that the community needs to come together and say if though they want those cameras, um, I think that we are a lot of times misinformed. Um, as a community and we don't stand together um, and we just let day to day go by and we just not paying attention. So that's like one of my biggest concerns is, is that we as a community don't stand up for what we know to be right. And then we get people who are in our community who are black in certain positions that support certain things. And then we just be quiet because we see a black person in that position. So I, so for me, I, I, John, I, I'm, I'm kind of torn between the two. Uh, between private and public only because I was a victim of a violent crime. I was shot uh, three times in 2021, um, which was on camera uh, <laughs> and they couldn't even get a conviction. Right. And, it, and it's, it's like plain as day. Right. So, you know, I, I think like for me in those communities that, that do have cameras, I think that because aren't those cameras there to protect the property, right? Allegedly. Like, like it's there to protect property, right? Not not to monitor, allegedly. I'm just saying allegedly. Well, from what I've read from San Francisco Safe and some of the other organizations, they are there to monitor violence, illegal activities, uh, legal dumping, you know, all this construction going on in San Francisco. They, they're monitoring a construction site. This is what they said. And, and, you know, this is what they're saying. I mean, you look on their websites and they got all this information about what they're doing with this information. And I just don't think it aligns uh, with the community. And again, community, I want to make this clear because I don't want nobody to think that I'm saying I'm against surveillance and cameras. OK, it's not what I'm saying. All right. And I know some people email me. Well, you don't have a problem with the mayor and her proposed measure next year to, <laughs> to do surveillance. I'm going to make y'all just I'm going to say it again because I know people will lie on me. OK. And I want to make sure I, I you, you guys understand what I'm saying. If you are acknowledging to the community, to the public, what the mayor did, she put it out there. Hey, I want the police to have access to drones, more surveillance, things of this nature as we're trying to combat crime in our city. 
she's telling us what it is. I have a problem with these private and these entities who are behind the scenes being quiet and not being transparent of what they're doing with these cameras and information. That's my issue. Okay. So if the mayor is going to come out there and say, hey, this is what we're doing. I don't have a problem with it. At least I know. Now, if you want to be a fool out there, you want to do crime and you want to do stuff and you have the understanding that you're being surveilled by drones, by cameras and all of this, then, hey, whatever that person or that individual decides to do, they have to deal with it. But to Rico's point, we got all of these cameras in the city. Violence happens, shootings, robbery. They can never figure out and charge anybody. But you know what's mighty funny? When the police officers do something or somebody do something to police officers, the camera, they got the footage. It's just, it's just my buzz. It's like, oh, the same cameras in the same area. Somebody got killed. We can't find anything. Well, sometimes. Because body cams, they don't I'm always, just saying. Most, the body cams ain't always working. But 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 to but to the body camera movement, this is my pushback to what you said about that earlier, Nina. Police officers, body cameras, you're a civil servant. OK, once you make that commitment to wear that job and be in that position, OK, they don't get that right. We're taxpayers. They have a right. We have a right. But let me go ahead. You do have a right. But let me tell you, there's already been several cities around this country that have taken it and sued to try to stop the public from filming. Um, it's gone all through the fifth, ninth circuit on up. And they have upheld that people do have a right to film by your first amendment. So at the end of the day, I'm just saying, when we start putting it out there, like, well, what are they doing with our data? Can we film them? Just know that the police are on the other end trying to prevent us from filming them because they don't want their data or the things that they want or the things that they do public. So it's even been proposed like in Arizona in 2022, they wanted to lock people up for being able to film. Thank goodness it didn't pass. But just know that, you know, the right to privacy is a slippery slope when you come in the public. You know, so that's all I'm saying with that. And it's oh, not I'm that not, I understand I'm that they pay. I, I understand you. we pay their salaries. I understand this. And they do work for us. They absolutely work for the public. But what I'm saying is just be mindful that they also want to take away um, rights to privacy on the they, grounds of not being able to control the data. Yeah, they could they could want to do that all they want. And I think it should be public. And I think any police officer, whether it's their personal cell phones or any government um, given phone privacy should be public knowledge, okay? Just right now, okay? I'm going to just tell you how important this is. In San Jose, right now, breaking news, uh, ABC7 News in San Jose, one of the officers who were involved with the racial text and the stuff that they was doing, sending text messages to each other, they just fired him. The San, the San Jose police chief just fired one of those officers and they got like 15 others. But let me tell you what they was doing. They was uh, profiling black people, Latin people, you know what I mean? Saying racist stuff to my, oh, we go falsely plant stuff. I mean, this is what they was doing. So why shouldn't the community know about this? Because these are the people who are taking our people away and, 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 you know, in charge of, you know, the investigations that go to these court proceedings, right? And if we have people that's in these positions that are thinking in that manner, that are negatively impacting the relationship between community and law enforcement, that's why we have to have that. OK, I, I, they could push back on us recording and whatever, because my thing is this. If you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're not really worried. But I also think there's oversight that's needed. Right. And again, I brought this issue up. I'm making I publicly went out there about this issue. OK, and I'm going to just tell you, I'm not satisfied with the Department of Police Accountability in San Francisco. OK, I'm telling you, there, there's some changes that need to happen with these city officials because it's too much buddy buddy. OK, I'm talking about the police commission in San Francisco, these folks. It's two arm in arm um, with the police. And I'm like, where's the accountability at? Okay, because we got issues in our community that's happening and I don't see no accountability. And when I ask these questions to folks, well, if you're in charge of police accountability, who's accountable of these surveillance programs? Who's watching them? Who's monitoring them? If this is Department of Police Accountability, they know nothing. And you reach out to these folks and they, I'm just telling you. This program of the I'm, I'm not even gonna go there on the Department of Public Accountability. I'm gonna just tell you right now. See, everybody worried about the mayor making cuts. The first thing we need to start cutting is some of these department heads. 
Okay, because these folks don't care nothing about their job. They don't care nothing about the community. They have no interest in the community. All right, but these are the same people asking, I need more staffing. I need all of this. They want taxpayers to pay more money. And they're not doing nothing to protect the interests of the community. And I think it's a little bit too much close relationships what's going on when we talk about holding police accountable. And I think some of these departments have time to make some changes at some of these higher level positions when we talk about uh, these city department heads who are impacting our communities and not invested and in making sure that our communities get the service that we so deserve because we are taxpayers and we are paying uh, for these services in our city. <laughs> oh, here, I don't know. No, right, right. I mean, I thought I was, I was waiting for Mark. I thought he had some. Well, well I, I, again, there, there are so many things that that you could say about it, and, and I, I think about it kind of big picture. I mean, I'll be honest. Um, as somebody who who liked espionage, spy movies, who who watched The Matrix, who who read a few books, and, and who's dealt with law enforcement on both sides the acts of surveillance has a purpose like and and this is the thing i think we're as the community is just everyday people we got to be kind of practical because anybody who's consciously aware of recent history in america understands that every time the system has had something particularly that was aimed at or heavily uh enforced in the black community it did not work out to our good so let's just recognize a we are in a sort of confrontation there's no other reason for them to have surveillance either than to control manipulate or profit off of us so when i just kind of think about strategy wise just practical whenever there's surveillance you have counter surveillance like this is like you got to have some kind of um strategy on how we're going to deal with this are there laws are there policies are there things that they should go by to enforce um accountability and transparency yeah that, that's on the books but we also understand that people who claim to protect and serve the community don't exactly do that as well so so we have to understand what we're dealing with and the question is like john said if we're not doing anything then you really have nothing to worry about just understand that it's there conduct yourself accordingly but we know that there's always an agenda behind it so my question again back to us as community people what are we gonna do about it we got it we got to attack it on both fronts should we make them abide by their policies and hold them accountable hell yeah but they they gonna study us and, and they gonna treat us just kind of like a, an experiment they they know how to move people they know how to manipulate people they know how to control people they've studied us but we give them like like sister need to say we, we give them data every day all day on where we go who we with what we eat when you think about homes you got ring cameras you 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 you've got google with, with if you've got the nest in your home or if you've got the, the like there's so many ways that our data is being extracted and collected on us on a daily basis are we willing to take the initiative to take back our privacy if we really want it because that means you're gonna have to stop being so convenient and you have to read through some of them things before you check the box and agree to it but so many times we've already forfeited our freedom so now this is kind of a mute point honestly having this argument we know they're going to mishandle the money. They know we know somebody got something up their sleeve. Are they going to tell us the truth? Nine times out of 10, I ain't got much faith in the system. So all I'm going to have to do is trust me and my people. What are we going to do about it? Because they can't. It's like like football. Um, They can't stop us from running our play. They can watch us. But as long as we stay organized and committed and stay on code together, they can't stop us from being the best version of ourselves for our community. They can watch all they want. Yeah, but I, th I think that it's important for us still to see like what like what data are you collecting? It's important for them to be at least transparent with that to understand like what kind what type of data they're collecting so we can see because like even with counterintelligence, you at least have to see something to counter that intelligence, right? So if you're not getting the data and the data that they're collecting to see the vision in the direction they're trying to go, you can't even counter nothing. So no, like no, we, I, I I get you, Rico, and this is why no, I'm, I'm like, you. I'm with you 100. Because I, I I'm like, it's some brothers. Like, this is where I think a lot of us as I'm talking my young people, 
get into the STEM, get into technology, get into cybersecurity, because these are the skill sets that our community is going to need to be able to build the right tools to make sure our community has our own source of information that ain't corrupted by the established system. Because we know corporations ain't nothing but modern plantations. So we're yeah. going to have to develop our own. Like, like this is the kind of warfare, so to speak. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not advocating violence, nobody. But I'm just saying, nobody's coming to save black folks. We're going to have to take our money. We're going to have to take our brains. And we're going to have to take our unity. And even if they watching us, again, if we ain't doing nothing wrong, that we ain't got nothing to hide, watch all you want. We, we know you extracting everything from what we listen to what we eat what we wear like like okay you see who goes where but again if we ain't got nothing to hide we good let, let, let's give them something to see but let's make sure we control our narrative i agree and i also before you jump in john here i just want to say this one <laughs> little thing is just that like we already know what they're gonna do they're gonna do what they've been doing over these centuries, over these years, they gonna keep trying to oppress us. I don't need to know what they doing with my data to know what they about to do next. If they letting us go, letting us out on the street only to lock us up in another way. So there, which is gonna be home confinement. Like now, okay, we gonna let you go, but now they making money off of the ankle bracelets because we just gonna lock you in your home. So that's where they going next with it. I mean, we it, it it never stops. And yeah, I'll just say I don't need the day. I don't need to know what they doing with my data to know that they about to do something wicked because it's always coming. Well, I, I, I disagree. And, and, and again, I hear you, Mark. I'm, I'm all for people. Hey, we're not doing the right. If we're doing the right thing, we're not worried about it. But I'm still worried about it. Even if you are doing the wrong, right thing. You got to be, John, you got to be. Because you, yeah. you got Pookie, you got Ray Ray. You got all <laughs> them folks who, who who's not us. Right. So we not doing nothing. We not. Right. So we got the individuals out in the community who just, who just, they still just need that support to get to a certain level. So, I understand why why you still kind of concerned because I'm kind of concerned for those individuals too because they still they doing something, and then they'll be caught up in the trap based on the data that's being collected by PD, and and just it being PD it, it it's it's fearful because San Francisco Gang Task Force half of them is federal agents, so you know when you start really like breaking this stuff down like you realize it's a bigger agenda that they even have. And to Nina, they are the those electronic monitoring. They have already 365 people on electronic monitoring right now in San Francisco. Right now, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I believe it. I I watched one of these. Like I can't remember what documentary it was, and it showed the big business. Like okay, the privatized prisons. They want to put those out of business. So what he do? He turn around and invest in ankle monitoring, home protect. It's it's crazy. <laughs> But I mean, I think one of the other things, too, is just, you know, again, you know, I've I seen a number of these documentaries, read a bunch of stuff, seen some YouTube videos about the, the STEM folks, like Mark was talking about, some of the black STEM folks. And they were talking about how AI, all these different programs are created by white folks. OK, these people talking about how the cameras, when it came to black folks, it couldn't recognize folks or put a number of black folks in the same identity lens. You get what I'm saying? That's scary stuff. All right, because if me and Rico walking down the street and our freaking face pop up like little Ray Ray and Pookie, and it's not me, now they arrested me saying, oh, no, you this person, right? Regardless if I have my ID or something, but it's putting me in a situation where that's causing me harm, it's causing me an inconvenience, right? Even though I ain't did nothing, I mean, that's still, you know, that's a problem, right? Because if this stuff is not recognizing who people are, right, there could be an incident that take place, whatever the incident is. You walk down the street and now they take your face, Nina, and be like, oh, you're a person of interest. Because but this you know, they don't even need to do that. Let's I mean, I mean, I mean, be real. I mean, you're a I mean, black person walking down the street in America. You are under suspicion. And they don't need no camera, no data to be like, oh, I thought I got you. Or I thought you were the one. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, it's a I lot know. of it, it's a lot of things. And, and we have to be real because we know that this stuff is used. I mean, even in the credit monitoring, I mean, what about commercially? Now we got businesses putting chips in people. It's like crazy stuff. What are they doing? You get what I'm saying? What are they trying to know so bad? It, it, it's just technology has evolved so swiftly. 
again, they've they've used this stuff before at military and, and, and high government levels. The fact that they're even announcing it publicly, they've already gotten all the usage out of it that they want. And, and, and this is where I mean, and I don't want to just play devil's advocate, but but this is where I, I have to look my, me and my people in the mirror like so much stuff we've just accepted it now we're, we're just okay with it we want the easiest path we want the comfort we want the convenience if we want to change our position in the world as a community we're going to have to do more we're going to have to do things differently nobody's handing us anything so when we see that okay technology is the big play now we're going to have to be just as aggressive about pushing our young people into the sciences, into technology, instead of pushing them into sports and entertainment. Like these are high level conversations as a community we need to continue to have. And that's why I'm so glad that we're having it here on both sides of the conversation, because most people aren't thinking about. Yeah. I mean, come on. We, we got people committing crimes and, and, and live streaming it like like what's we got issues. This is like a mental health thing now. We, I mean, Mark, I got to say this too, though, you know, because here's the flip side of it. Um, I was reading some uh, articles about some of the people who handled the surveillance. Okay. Um, it came out somewhere in the Midwest where this guy was uh, surveillance in hotel rooms where women were and started a platform. And these women didn't even know until one day, some, one of their family members, or some guy was on there was like, Hey, that's my niece. But nobody knew. I mean, this was going on for like four years. This guy was making millions of dollars selling footage of women in hotel rooms, women in different places inside their home. He had the tech. He had the savvy that he would break into home security systems. This dude right. was again. You, you, you can ask him, but, but cameras from the people in their house and were filming their children. The women, but you know that's different. But you can find that saying. on World Star Instagram OnlyFans. That is, there. you have an expectant right to privacy in your own home. Absolutely. Once those things start violating your home and people monitoring you inside your home, that's something different. But I also have it like somebody brought up the ring cam. Like the ring cam is an issue. Like I live in an apartment building. So what is my expectation of privacy, right? You got this, this ring camera on your door and I got to walk in this enclosed space. Like, what are you doing with that data? Who's watching me? So now, are you selling my data? You watching how many times I go? Like, what? It, it, it's just, it, it's interesting how people, how many times and how many ways we're surveilled. And then we are now so alarmed to like what Brother Mark said. Um, what is the point? What is the point at this point? And to your point also, one thing I am so for is the STEM. We have to promote STEM and we in the black community have to redefine how we teach our kids what success is and what it actually looks like. Because it's not LeBron James for everyone. We know only like one and one millionth person going to end up like LeBron James. So teaching them and the United States has actually found themselves in a really peculiar situation. Um, at the at their own behest, they have sequestered the advancement of black and brown people in tech, in STEM. But now you have where the world has evolved and our military has evolved that our next war will probably be fought technology, like the, the technical component. There's going to be a lot of technology in that. And you can't outsource your defense. So now this is why you see the United States with this huge reinvestment in kids and coding and kids. They, they, I mean, in elementary school, they teaching kids to code now. It's unheard of. Before, like five years ago, it was like a hidden gym. Nobody had the cute code to like it. But now they they trying to get up because you realize that you can't outsource your defense. So definitely pushing our kids to that STEM and having them take advantage of it, because now like here, code tenderloin does coding for free. There's all kind of things for kids to do to get into this coding, and we really need to push our kids that way. Well, I'm getting to the accountability part because I think it's oversight that's needed. We need to have a conversation about oversight and all these levels. Yeah. What does that what does that look like for community? What does this oversight need to happen? Because I'm gonna just tell you right now, from what I just experienced going through these issues. I'm not so confident in the people. And I'm going to tell you, this is what our company, our country has done, Mark. See, they use black folks that look like me and you. 
to sell the safety. Oh, everything is okay. I don't trust these black people that look like me. I'm gonna just tell you. Hey, John, I got the you deal with them. I'm gonna just tell you, we gotta be careful community because they, they purposely put black people. Sometimes they be like they got some hood credit or whatever. They put them in these spaces so that you can think, oh, it's okay, and they can run their game. And I'm tired of it because I'm gonna just say I don't trust these people that look like me. At all. I know a lot of them are terrible. Okay, these are the new gatekeepers, the people that look like you. They be selling us out behind the scene, and I, I, I just don't trust it. Okay, so I, just because you black and you in tech, I don't always trust everybody. All right, because some of our people are just, just as terrible, Rico. No, for sure. I look, I look. Since I've been shot, I've been called like five times to come and speak at engagements, and once I figure out like what they want me to do, it's like. Uh... You know, you know that ain't me. I'm like you asking Rico to do some stupid stuff like that. Um, it just don't make sense. But to what to what Mark was saying and Nina was saying and you, I think our collective thought is is we need like some kind of reset within our community. We need like the great reset within community, and we just got to figure out how do we like uh, create a new foundation because like currently the foundation we own is embedded in white supremacy. And we can pretend that it's not, and we can act like our most educated individuals. They don't talk within white supremacy, and we can pretend that. But I think we just need that great reset. And then that way, John, we can start holding each other accountable. Because I think our fear is, is who want to make the sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice everything that you have to reset, to rebuild for the next up and coming generations? Because currently with the industrial, um, with this nonprofit complex, I call it, um, uh, has become the new church. You know, because remember when the churches was big, everybody go to the church, they assimilate all the information to the church. Now the nonprofit is, is, is that new thing. Now the nonprofit is for some people. And then now the nonprofit is the new dope for the people who is reformed, right? So we got to somehow figure out like how do we come together as a community and say you know what we just got to make the ultimate sacrifice and we just got to stand with each other because the educational system is too old it's too worn down our kids aren't fully invested in in anything about it and we just got to educate our own children because we because john if we don't have a, a a structural change we just gonna continue to go down the same road currently like by how i look at the violence within our community it reminds me of the dark ages of Europe. It really reminds me of that. Like it's the more of a modern version of it, but it reminds me of the dark ages when, you know, they were slaughtering each other and it was cold war and all that type of stuff. So I think like we just got to figure out like, what does that look like? Because, you know, right now, all of our, or not all, I ain't gonna say all, majority of the community leaders within a lot of communities you know, the money, the money talks, right? <laughs> and if you can pay them a couple of bucks, you know, they're going to sell out the whole entire community. And then at that point, community don't say nothing. And then we got this snitching culture that's embedded in everything that we do. We ain't going to pretend like it's just only in the street stuff. It's everywhere within Black people, right? So we got to even stop that and find ways to create brotherhood and sisterhood when we come together and say, you know what? I'm going to hold you accountable. You know you out of pocket. I ain't going to no police, but we got to hold each other accountable amongst each other. So that way we can start saying, you know what? Do y'all all agree with these cameras in our community? And then, and then when the consensus say, oh, yeah, we agree. And then we go to the police and say, okay, we want the data to see what's happening, what's going on. Then we can get some traction and some movement because it's a large number of us. Currently with 3%. And, on, and only 1.5 of the 3% is with the movement, it's, it's hard for us to get anything. Our, like our lobbying skills is terrible. No lie, like we are not good lobbyists because everybody agenda is different. Bro Brother Rico, can I ask you something? And you and brother, because again, I'm I'm in Houston, Texas. Y'all y'all in the Bay Area, y'all y'all in the area. Y'all remember in, in the movie Malcolm X, you remember the scene when they went up there to go check on the brother and, and they had all the brothers lined up and, and they were organized. Do you think just within our community where, where you're at, do you think it's possible to get groups of 
five to ten people just on their street or in their neighborhood just to get organized consistently just to do something positive do you think that's a reality no we've tried so it so, in, in, so, in. so how how can so so I, i'm glad you're being honest so let, let, let's be real how can we expect to have any unity to go about any policy or, or get laws changed if we can't even organize just to come together for something good like like we got to build a nation from the foundation that's what we're literally we're trying to do is we're trying to restore our nation within a nation. And we can't even get on code together for simple stuff yet. Mark, we just got to learn how to work together because there's beef within everything. I'm, I saw like I was raised in a community called the Fillmore. And then John was raised in a community called the Bayview. So when it's time to do something, I'm from Fillmore. I'm from Bayview. No, I'm from San Francisco. I represent black San Francisco. So then it, it creates beef with even with that. Then even with with the black leadership, majority of the leadership here in San Francisco is black women, which is great. Right. So since they're majority elite of the leaders, when we talk about black men, I love black women incarceration. I, I love them to death. I'm married to one, been married for, to one for 20 years. So I'm just saying the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that it creates a, a friction between two groups. Right. Instead of us saying, OK, I'm going to take away my, my role and I'm just going to stand next to you as a brother and a sister so that we can make or push this agenda. But what happens is you get people who say, I'm not bringing no brothers to the table and we're going to talk about black men violence prevention. We're going to talk about black men, mental health. We're going to talk about everything black men. But you ain't a black man, a black man. Right. So, so like a lot of that, I mean, it kind of frustrates me. Only because I, I see it from a whole different lens. I don't see, I see it. I want to see the future. I see the future. I'm a visionary. I want to see, okay, boom, what you did was great. And I can see the effects 10 years from now. Like, but what we, what I'm currently seeing is these band-aid effects that constantly happen within our community. And it, and we have no growth at all. Now I'll, I'll be honest. This is as a brother. Cause I know exactly how you feel. And sister Nina, you can attest to this. The sisters for, they still got that ability to click up. They sisters can get together. Yeah. It might not be a whole they bunch don't. of them, but, but if they like <laughs> each other and they can not be petty don't. with each other, my our sisters can come together. Hey, hey, Mark, if I we can that. get that from them, <laughs> they don't. And I'm gonna tell hey, you, I, women I was, is dope. They I was dope. Just, they dope, but it's a pushback. I got pushback. But go ahead. You here. always got a pushback, John Henry. I'm waiting for it. But my thing is, I I was just having this conversation with a young lady the other day, and I do believe that somehow after George Floyd, black people have become ju now just a little kinder, a little more patient, and a little more community focused. And what I think is the answer, um, well, what I think, how do we build or how do we get our community to like stand guard? We got to give them something to believe in. We got to give them a leader that they can follow. We have to give them because it's too many voices. And to Rico's point, everybody's in San Francisco saying everything. There's like 80 nonprofits and they all trying to do the same thing instead of like having a few, you know, it, it's not about quantity is quality right and coming together with less nonprofits we could probably get some really some really amazing things done in san francisco and to your point rico i love when you say how you was like i'm from the fillmore john grew up in bayview but now how about i'm just represent black san francisco and i put this back on you black men rico and john to just go ahead and start framing it that way i'm a black san francisco siskin no, everywhere we go, that's what we say. That's what we yeah. say. We that's say, okay. I say. I don't know. They try to, they try to put me in my neighborhood, but I always shut that down. No, and correct the young people when no, they I'm start saying it. Right, right. <laughs> So I mean, I can't, right. wait, accountability. I, accountability. What, what, what happened to us being family? I, I mean, like, look, your grandmother grew up on one side of the street. My grandmother grew up on the other side just because it's a different neighborhood. Like, we still family. Why, why are we allowing geography we don't even own to be a source of division amongst us? NWA. <laughs> so I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this because I, I got to say this, okay? And this is not just in San Francisco. This is across this country. 
yes, our black women are very dope, very powerful, very educated, very strategic, very intentional, a lot of things. But I'm going to just tell you this. <laughs> a lot of black women who are gatekeeping our community. There's a lot of black leaders that are women that are gatekeeping our community. I just want to be real. And I'm not going to let y'all off the hook and just say how great y'all. I'm going to tell you how terrible some of them are too, okay? And I'm going to tell you right now because I'm in this industrial complex of non uh, nonprofits, okay? And I'm going to just tell you right now, a lot of these women are very terrible, Rico. I just got to say, okay? And they, they continually, okay, impact the movement of the community, right? Now, brothers... We ain't even stepped up. Brothers, we ain't even showed up. So I'm going to hold the brothers accountable too. We ain't even showing up. But when we do get brothers to show up, we got these sisters who are very powerful and strategic and intentional, who are gatekeeping and keeping brothers in, in the community from moving forward. And we just got to be real. And a lot of them are wounded too. So yeah. they don't they don't even like they men. Some of them got daddy issues. Some of them then had relationship issues and trauma. So now you have unhealed women personally that look like you, but because they're in the position of power, this is where the psychology of, of hypergamy plays uh, its place because a woman is going to protect her attachment and availability to resources. First and foremost, that is in her DNA. She is to seek out the best opportunity for resources. So if her money is coming from her job and her job is making sure she got to keep Negroes like you out of position, she going to be the best at it. And, and it, it's diabolical, but this goes back all the way to, to the Willie Lynch process and how they used to they used to demasculate all the men in front of the women and then give the women the best positions in the house and on the plantation. And they wouldn't deal directly with the men. They would only deal through the women. And they knew that was another way to give the, a woman a psychological disregard and disrespect for her black man. Like this stuff goes okay. deep. Okay. That's, okay. The, that, I, that's the counterintelligence. That's um, the counterintelligence right there. <laughs> as the only black woman on this panel, I'm going to say this. Black men have every opportunity to take their rightful place. Demand it. Like, I don't understand why women have to give you anything. Nobody is giving black women anything. And do I, mu must I quote Malcolm X? I disagree I with you. Malcolm X about what he said about the black woman in the world? is the most disrespected absolutely so everything that and i have my own issue i do think that it's a lot of control a lot of things that are happening women just happen to be in power but i'm gonna say you gonna need as black men to get organized y'all need to be going in the streets why don't y'all start programs getting these young folks and i'm not saying i don't know what's being done so i can't say i don't know why don't y'all start but demand your place take nina it. Nina, I think subconsciously there's a piece of black men that don't want to do that because what is what has happened in history, every time black men create movements like that, we end up dead or in jail. But let me tell you, every these movement, black women, black every women movement. started black lives no, they matter. Up, no, they they uplift black women no matter black what. Black lives matter some bullshit. Facts. Oh, now see, we just had a whole conversation about that. Me, I'll, I'll just say, I had the, a conversation. The, I stand behind me. the statement, but that, that organization that is part. not what the statement should represent. But let me now, oh, now, now Nita, finish. before you make your next statement, Nita. Okay, there is surveillance footage out there to show how black women are purposely being gatekeepers and keeping black men from selling. Do you want to see that footage? <laughs> there are there are gatekeeping black women keeping black women out of stuff. So at the same time, it's very clickish too. But I do think we are doing a better job of uplifting one another. But I'm gonna say black. I just gotta say this about Black Lives Matter. I stand on the words that it says. But like, you see how quick they were able to tear down that movement. It took them all of like three months. They leaked, the woman bought a house, this one did that, but how does the NRA support itself? Nobody cares how the NRA is buying their homes or mothers against drug drivers and all they, those they, other they, they own the media. Again, they also own Black Lives Matter. They put the money up. They used it as a front to flip because they know we gonna tear ourselves down even more. Again, our own people have been used as agents against us. 
every uh, black leader in Africa was that was uh, assassinated. It was somebody next to him. Malcolm X was killed by people. It, it's always us. They they know how to use us. They they keep Barack Obama on us. Like they're gonna give us something that looks like that we relate to, but they're gonna have their agenda. They don't have the same spirit, the same mindset as true black people. I mean, you think about all these people in fraternities. You got a bunch of grown African descendants pretending, pledging allegiance to be Greek. Come on now. If you really understood history and how Greek people were, we, black folks would not be pledging their allegiance to be part of nothing that's considered I'm Greek. They would go back to the original origins in Africa and get that same knowledge. But but this is growing up in America. One of the unfortunate dysfunctions we have is we can't even recognize how sick we are because we've never had our trauma addressed or dealt with. And we're just expected to look at life like everybody else, like we ain't never been through nothing and, and suck it up. And, and we're just at a point. We're, we're, we're not going to keep taking the younger generations coming up. They're looking at us wondering why we kept putting up with so much. They're not going to take it. And we have to do our part to give them more information and a better opportunity to live in a way that is true to who they really are. Not just trying to buy into the system. We came up still in the generation. We was trying to shuck and jive just to get on the corporate plantation, have a comfortable life. That don't work. They're squeezing everybody. And black folks are getting squeezed the hardest. Nina, you're triggering my audience. The women now think that we're going down a rabbit hole. You see what you started? This is what you started. Well, I'm going to finish it, but I have to say there is proof. Um, because when you say that there these advancements are not happening for black women, you got to look at the programming that has been provided to them, right? It was a, it was a point in 2000 to like 2008 where uh, the same access to education for black men and black women was like five to one. They would give black women full scholarships, program and support. They didn't get at the black men. So that's an advantage right there. Right. When you look at housing, OK, black women, single mothers was getting access to housing and child care to go to school to learn. Right. When it was single fathers out there who was taking care of their kids, and they couldn't get that. To this day, it's still set up like that. I got single fathers calling me all the time. John, I can't get none of the support that my sister gave. We got the same identical situation. So there is a systemic thing um, that takes place when it comes to the advancement of black men and black women, right? And I'm not saying that the sister's been holding it down. And I, and, I, and I put this to the black man, like what we're seeing in our community. Black men have become beat down, right? They just kind of threw their hands up. Right now, our community is just throwing up their hands. Our community is asleep behind the wheel right now. OK, with everything that's going on. And I think a lot of the black men got disconnected from community and family because the way the systemic laws programs was set up against them. I can't come in my own house. Right. If I stay there, I got to get put out. If I have a child and we're not together, I got to pay child support. If I get divorced, I get nothing. You get what I'm saying? So what it does is it beats the brothers up to the point where like, I don't want to get involved. I'm not saying that that's an excuse because I would never do that. But that's what happens when you have so many roadblocks, so many barriers, so many things to stop you from being involved. And then on top of all having legislatively being put out of your house, your community, your kid's life. Then we got our black woman who's saying, we're the only one at the table. We're the only one doing stuff for black men. Where y'all at? Y'all ain't nothing, right? We got to deal with that too. Then we try to get in the, into it. Then they don't want to listen to you because I sit in these meetings and I'm like, sometimes they go in there and tell these women, I, why are you speaking for a man? Are you a man? I have to say that sometimes. Then they get mad and kick me out. I'm like, you telling me all this stuff about what men need. I don't know how long you've been a man because I need to know. Okay, I understand I'm in San Francisco and we got different people who I identify and there's no shot to those folks. But I need to say this because I got more women in these meetings speaking up about man services and what men need. And it ain't no man speaking. And then as soon as a man start talking, then they want to shut you. Whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. I said, hold on. I don't want to hear from you no more. Yeah, I had enough. Close your mouth. I don't want to hear nothing. Let the man speak for what they need. Let the man come to the table and have their budget and do the things the way they want, not the way women want to do it. I got a lot of women trying to create man programming. Man, we want to have this for man and this house going to run. I'm saying that's not what brothers want. 
You know what I'm saying? We can't even come together. We got Father's Day coming up. I got all these women trying to tell fathers what they want for Father's Day. I'm still confused. I'm like, hold on. When do the men say what they want? It's our day. And even on our day, I got a bunch of women telling men what they should do. I don't know. We got a problem out there, ladies. Y'all got to do a better job instead of y'all place. Okay? Be oh, not saying. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Stay in her place. Oh, you killing me. You killing me. You killing me. I think that was, that I would be funny. I would be a funny. I think everybody I should know. assume a role. I think everyone should assume a role and let, I think people like women should speak for women and men should speak for men. Can we at and least together we speak for empathy? community? Exactly. Uh, thank you, brother Rico. Thank you. Because we do need some more empathy in the conversation. Because I ain't gonna lie, we both got 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 some issues on this as far as men and women go. But we do <laughs> need to acknowledge the other side with some empathy, not just waiting to respond. Yeah, I agree. So right. now I bring this show to y'all today, trying to tell y'all how we need to protect the surveillance because I'm trying to help protect our women. And making sure nobody's, you know, being peeping times on our women, making sure nobody's doing any of this stuff. Well, let's be fair, and our men. So don't leave your men out, right? You leaving your men out. You don't care about the protection of your men. We want to make sure our black I, men are equally protect protected, woman, John Henry. Me. All I'm saying, protect our black men too. See, you see this black woman standing up for black men? Protect our black men. I love our brothers. Thank uh, you, honey. Queen. We appreciate that. Hey, From the hey, men's John. delegation. Hey John, that's that's so so as I'm listening, the dysfunction within our community is kind of like why so like with the, so with the surveillance and get going back to that and how if we really wanted to and came together as a community, we actually can get whatever data that we want if we just came together. But the dysfunction within our community will actually stop us from even moving forward because I'm a hundred percent sure that there are individuals that work for some of these agencies that's controlling the data that we're going to see and folks going to be like, I'm halting. I don't want that person to lose a job. I don't want no conflict with this individual. So the dysfunction within our community is what stops our progress all the time. So, we, yeah, we just got to stop battling, John. The battle, the battle it, you know... I I don't want to battle. I just want. I just want Nina to know when you get married, Nina. Okay, because I know you're getting close. Okay, when that man uses <laughs> surveillance to track you around and watch what you do, <laughs> just remember you agreed to it. Okay, <laughs> you okay with it? <laughs> Not when he's surveilling me around. Uh, well, the good thing is he has an Android. I have an iPhone, so there's no family tracking happening there. Maybe you drop an <laughs> air pad or air, whatever those things are. Air but no, I, I, yeah, one of those things. Oh, but it's I got a tag. Air tag. Yeah, air the tag. air tag. The air tag. But yeah, surveillance. But, but I think one of the things that we could do, and you know, I can't wait as a community leader, you know, to have all of the organizations that I would like when it comes to these issues when they come up. And I think Mark said it earlier, you know, media has a big influence, right? If we can't get our community organized, one thing as media and 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 what we do to keep that light on what the issue is, you know what I mean? Because it might not be a lot of us, <clears throat> but if we utilize our community media, and I think that's what's the most important thing um, that black people, brown people, we have to do is we have to create our own media that we can highlight and put the pressure on these systems, these institutions, these lawmakers, and these elected officials um, to hold them accountable because we're not going to have everybody on call. We're not going to get the whole community together, but we know what media does to expose and put pressure on people. So what I can, only thing that I can really do is utilize our voice as a community media to make sure that we highlight and address these issues, right? And, and, and we know what the community is feeling because they're complaining about it. I'm telling you, the reason why all this is coming up, the community wants oversight. The community wants to know. We got families in our community that are frustrated because they're like, there's cameras everywhere, John. My daughter was killed. My son was killed. You know what I'm saying? And why is it that we have these cameras here and they don't see anything? But when something happens to a police officer, when something happens to somebody, they got all the footage. It doesn't add up to these people, right? The same corner that something happened, you know, all of a sudden, 
these cases and this stuff, it comes up, right? And my only thing is this. Again, community, I'm saying it so y'all can hear it clear because I know somebody after the show who go back and tech, call Police Chief Scott. Oh, John Henry's advocating to take all the cameras down. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is there's oversight that is needed. We need a community oversight group to also be a part of the monitoring of these programs, right? We also need... <coughs> um, we need the, the information, right? We need to know where these where the cameras is. I think that's a community right. That's just basic human rights, right? Okay, like you said, Nina, we, we know they surveillance. We're giving up our data for free. I agree with all of that, right? But that's something our personal that we have attached to us, our phone. Now we're talking about commercially in our community. The community has a right to know where they surveillance and as where the cameras is, whether you're doing crime, not or whatever. There's a there's a there's a public notice that needs to happen, right? And then for the people who monitor our oversight or oversee those cameras or camera systems, we need to have the data on what those cameras are capturing, how many times they're accessing that equipment, who has access, and what is the security protections that are over there. And I think that's just fair. I, I'm not asking for anything crazy. I'm not saying I'm not against camera, but I, what I'm saying is if we don't get ahead of this, Nina, we're headed down a, a, a road that we don't want to go. San Jose and Oakland has already passed the laws that went in effect. Okay. Immediately now in Oakland and San Francisco, the cameras now monitor your speed. Okay. Let me just tell y'all community. If you go 11 miles per hour over the speed limit, in any part of Oakland and city of San Jose, you will get a ticket in the mail and a point on your record. And let me tell you why this is bad, okay? Because who you think will be impacted the most by the surveillance system that they have? This, we're not even going to talk about the violent surveillance. Let's just talk about the, what they're trying to do with the traffic tickets, okay? If right now in San Francisco, we have the highest, with the statistic numbers, when the Human Rights Commission went out and did their community service, being stopped while black. Black people had the highest tickets that were given by law enforcement okay so now let me tell you about your theory nina so now these officers who are over the surveillance cameras in san jose and oakland they get a right to choose who gets those tickets so once those people run those license plates to see oh this is old little marianne from oakland hills oh don't worry we're not gonna push the ticket to her Oh, but there's Nina Smallwood, a black woman. She's in Oakland, 13 miles per hour. Send her the ticket. Did you see where I'm going with this? They this already is... do that, though. I'm, I'm just, just like, saying. I'm just like, I, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it creates their be able to give out more. To, and let me be clear. Now, if there's a business that is installing, to your point, they are installing um, cameras in neighborhoods. You have the public does have a right to know if it's not for public safety, for any other reason, if someone is going to profit or make money off of that, it definitely needs the community's um, approval. It should have. So to that, I agree. Um, but as far as like the police using it to give a ticket randomly to a black person, I mean, we're over police. We're overstopped for air fresheners everything else and i think it'll just be and it'll be us that'll be affected for sure 100 percent. they're gonna put them in oakland they're gonna be on international um they're gonna be on bancroft everywhere else in san francisco they're gonna be on third street probably just from the little bayview park gonna stop at dog patch like yeah i i definitely know they are going to use it against us for sure so but nina, let me, let your me point, ask you this question nina let me ask you this question mm -hmm. are you okay with america bringing the china style social credit and surveillance. So now they'll have cameras that monitor people for their social behavior. Are you okay with uh, a new social surveillance to say if you act well and you're a good citizen, you could travel out of the country, you could catch the muni, you could do the things that you need to do. And when your social credit score goes down, you can't access anything. Are you okay with that? I need to know. Of course not. Of course not. I'm not saying I want to live in communist China and under a surveillance state, but I'm just saying like the things that, I mean, they've had red light tickets or red light cameras for years. So now they just doing it. They added a speed component to it. I mean, where does it end? I don't know. I think that's your bigger point. Like, where does it end? I don't know where it ends, but I do know to Rico's point, we are too few in numbers to do it alone with the 1.5 it's going to take the three percent of us that are here to actually 
care about this to actually get some um, some traction. Who is oversight? We are oversight. The community is the oversight. We have to be the oversight. So start getting more of those people to go down to City Hall when they have those city, those meetings, those supervisor meetings. We are oversight. We don't need another. And if and the whole thing is when you see these places who have gotten oversight implemented in their police departments, it's because the community rallied for it. Not just one, not just two, the community. So to Rico's point, we got to build community. We got to figure that part. We got to figure that component out first. Because if we don't, we're doomed. <laughs> we're doomed. And, you know, they're only going to keep pushing forward. You know, they're not, they'll, ne they'll never stop. They're, they'll find new ways, hidden agendas to figure out on how to bamboozle us and, and for us not to be in the know and in the light. But there always is a remnant of individuals who know and that will always continue to fight for the people. We just got to find ways on how to bring more people into the fold um, at the end of the day. I mean, sometimes, I mean, for me, radical isn't radical. Radical is normal for me and and John. I, I mean, I hear John all the time and people like, oh, he radical. To me, John is normal. What the, what you mean he's radical, right? So I think like looking at, look at it from that lens and, and being able just to check each other and hold each other accountable and getting back to the community model and throwing away the neighborhood model um, within our communities. Because when our neighbors put on that hood to hide, um, that's when our community started to change. So now we got to be more communal to come together to bring unity within our communities so that our young people can start seeing us as it used to be. I'm older, I'm like, I'm 42. I remember being not being whooped by my, my, my neighbor and grabbed up by some dude on the street i didn't even know but he said he knew my mama walked me all the way home and spanked me and then she spanked me i remember that and, and to me that that model that community model works for us and i think we just got to get back to that and, and and find um ways to um become one because currently our individualism is what separates us uh I mean, I think we all are great. We all got great ideas. I just think like sometimes we just got to get out of ourselves and start being more selfless for the greater good. And I think, and I'm going to let you, I just want to say this last little part. And I just think <laughs> to the black people, we need to be kind to ourselves. We need to, we need to be kind to ourselves to understand that we just went through something extremely traumatic as a black community. I am old enough to remember, like everyone on here, the 80s the 90s what happened we know what happened to our community it is no mystery it is no secret we understand why we are fractured why we are broken but i do for just i have hope and i do have belief that we are starting to cut we are coming out of this we are coming out of this and this is why you see john henry both sides of the conversation rico doing great work like there's so and when i spoke about why there's so many nonprofits, um but these are great people doing great things, right? So when I say that, this means that everybody is trying to fill a gap, fill that need. So I definitely think that we need to be kinder to ourselves and give ourselves some grace to understand that we just came out of something traumatic and we are in the process of rebuilding and we will rebuild. We doing it. We're not trying, well, we doing. Well, I gotta say, I am radical, Rico. And I, I know a lot of people don't like it, but I am radical and I'm gonna stay radical because I'm gonna tell you why. See, when you tell the truth in our community, people want to say you're crazy. That's the first thing they want to say. Oh, he's crazy. You're crazy. But that's the problem. This is why we where we at, right? Because we got pastors, we got preachers, we got community leaders for many years who are being wrong to our community. And everybody's standing there in silence. Who the, that, that's the pastor. Oh, but that's the community leader. Don't say nothing. We don't want to say nothing. This is black folks' problem. See, we've created our own problem. Because when people in our community do stuff, we stand silent. Then when things are out of control, we want to complain. That's why I'm tired of this this out this craziness, right? It, it's, it's just craziness in our community. And I'm telling you, the reason why we're never going to get ahead, I'm going to be real, because we're too reactive. All we do is react. Police kill somebody, we want to go march. 30 days later, we all back on the couch. Until we can have some consistency and some stability in everything that we do that accounts for Black people, we are in trouble. 
And let me tell you, since we're talking about black people where we at in San Francisco, in the next five to 10 years, you're going to see something in this country that you have never seen when it comes to normal black folks living. Because this housing crisis that we have in our community and with the help of these surveillance cameras is going to move so many people out of our community. All right. When you look at the livable cost of living in San Francisco, 78 percent of black people in San Francisco is not going to even have a livable wage in five to eight years. OK, so we got some bigger issues coming. OK, and if we don't stick together, if we don't wake up, because I'm going to tell you right now, black folks been hitting the snooze button on the alarm for a long time. OK, because there's an alarm, a loud alarm that is going off to black people right now. And we're not even paying attention. And that's just giving the system another one up to say, oh, they're beat down. They're defeated. Because this surveillance issue for all the people that are out there doing the wrong thing, they should have been going, oh, what's going on? They don't care. See, and when they sell this and package it up, see, they go to our seniors and our elders, and they just like, oh, I'm fine, because they, they don't understand. But the bigger push is we got big problems coming. And if we don't stop hitting the snooze button in this next five to 10 years, black people across this country, not just in San Francisco, we are in trouble. OK, the, the upcoming of AI and the amount of jobs and opportunity that it is removing from people, it's pretty scary. And I don't know why black folks are sitting back like, oh, everything is going to be good because I'm looking at it. and I'm saying we are in trouble. We are not in trouble. Oh, we in trouble. We, yeah. we not in trouble for that AI. We got troubles. Oh, we got trouble, but the AI is like not our trouble. And yeah. I would just argue we got problems coming up in 2024. We ain't got five to eight years. And first of all, not being able to live in San Francisco five to eight years, you can't live here now. They just said if you make less than a hundred thousand in this city, you are low income. So I mean, the problems that are affecting black folk are, yeah. are actually now. Let me just tell you, because you know I'm into you know I'm into this money, right? You know I'm big about finance. So they got a big article that just came out from the U.S. Treasury about black people. Okay, they're saying by 2053, black people economically will be wiped out in this country. Do you know the average black family right now in this country has less than a thousand dollars in their savings account? This is this is what surveillance does because you got to value. Let me just how tell you that. Do that. Listen, I'm about to tell you how. Let me tell you how they doing this, okay? And this is why these banks is now coming out. See, because y'all see, this is why you got to know what you're talking about. I'm going to tell you why. See, these banks right now, Wells Fargo, all the big banks right now is redoing their budget from COVID saying, oh, we made a mistake. We $360 billion in the red. You know how they know? Because they can look at the loans, the money that's given out, and they can look at the black people and the brown people and all the people that hold these loans. And they can look in their accounts and see if we're going to lose this much out of the job sector, we're going to lose this much out of the economy. All of these people are going to hit us and it's going to cost. And you know what's doing it? AI. So AI is reading all of the accounts. See, when you talk about what are they doing with our data, see, they, that's data. You say you're, you're checking account every day, you take money out. There's a computer system checking everybody. It can scan millions of accounts. We're talking about surveillance. Do you don't, think don't they're not surveillance part. on our money? Hey, then go back to cash. Cash is king. Do you, do you think they're not surveillance in our money? See, this is what they're trying to make that obsolete, too. Let's it's go like, back to like, talk. Economic warfare it is a real thing. And, and as a community, because again, we are like $1.3 trillion spending capacity. Like, like we would be one of the top nations of the world as the amount of money, but because we're unorganized and we have no structure of circulating our income, we don't produce anything. We don't make anything. We are consumers. So yeah, they know how to eliminate us as a market and extract all of our resources because they've done it. We don't own land. We don't own any business. We don't have any infrastructure. I mean, essentially, you look at the food deserts. You you, you look at how they start removing resources. They've taken the, the financial structures out. They are literally isolating black and brown communities and putting them on islands. And they're like they're, they're wiping us out. They could exterminate us. They could starve black people to death right now because we don't even have a way to get our own food. 
Right. And Mark, right. check this out. They closing all of these stores. Okay. This is not just in San Francisco. People just thought in San Francisco. Across this country, the malls are closing. The stores are closing. Who do you think occupied most of those jobs? Black and brown people. Those janitors. People who clean those malls. Black folks. See, they did the data and they find out more and more black people buying off Amazon and everywhere else. We don't need stores. But what we don't understand is we just buying off Amazon. Now they close the store. Those are jobs. You go in the bank right now, Mark. I went to my bank last week. There's one teller in there. A line across the door. I said, lady, what's going on? Why is it no other teller? Oh, they want you to use this. They're not putting more tellers in there because they want you to do online banking. But I said, do you understand if I don't walk in here, you don't have a job? She's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Same thing in the grocery store. I go to the grocery store. They say, why you don't go to self-checkout, sir? It's the last line over there. I said, lady, if I don't come to your line, you don't have a job. Do you understand that? You get what I'm saying? So as they continue to use robotics, automation, AI, it's a collective. It's not just AI. It's all of the things that are removing the jobs that most times black and brown people house. If you take those jobs, you take their financial being and their capital. Okay. I just yeah. watched the YouTube video. And this I mean, morning. They, they've done yeah. history. Go ahead, Rico. No, I was just going to say, like, everything that they do is for the inv advancement of their community and, and, and their people, which is, I think, is perfectly fine. We just got to find how do we advance our community, right? So when we look at DreamKeeper and a lot of initiatives that are amazing, that's giving money to Black people to do things that are great, we got to rise to the occasion. We can't just say, oh, Rico want to open up another food restaurant. Everybody in the Black community can't be chefs. Everybody in the black community can't be promoters. Like we really got to just start thinking outside the box. Who going to open the community grocery store? Who, Who going to make underwear? Who going right? to make socks? Like, <laughs> like we need practical yeah. and, 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 we, and we need people in place to create that infrastructure. So when we get three people who doing food, that's it. Any more ideas? We taking that to the other part of the town. Okay, now we're going to do promoters. We only need three of them. We don't need no more. We're going to do three good promoters. Boom. Any more? We done with that. Black education. Same thing. So we just got to put a structure to it that, that actually makes sense. Because currently, everybody is chefs. Everybody is promoters. Everybody opened up a nonprofit all of a sudden. Like, we, ev everybody can't do the service. I don't, I, need, I don't need another Rico, 35 year old rapper. Everybody opens up a boutique, okay? <laughs> All I want to say is, if you got to not, this. awareness is everything. If you cannot <laughs> see it, you cannot be it. We have to show Black people that you can be more than this. We have to show, we know this. We know this is what you need, but like- We're screaming I mean, at the top of our lungs. Listen, me and John scream this stuff at the top of our lungs, and it appears, and I get frustrated. I mean, I get frustrated to the point where I'm like, you know what? I'm just not dealing with folks because we say it over and over. Me and John been working with each other for three years and saying the same exact thing. We said this, like you can go to a show that happened three years ago. We saying the same exact thing. I swear to you, no lie. We're saying the same Wait, exact thing. Rico, and, 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 and they'll tell us, Rico, those are great I, ideas. What y'all saying is great. How can we help you guys? One conversation so and then it all disappeared. But if we saying this on this show, who are we saying this to in the community? Are we actually, maybe there needs to be another step to this mini grant process, right? Like when you, maybe there needs to be some education on what you can do. What is a viable business? People just say, oh, do a business plan. Well, I just got 5,000 and I'm going to spend it on this and we're going to do great things in the community. No, it's a little more, do your market research. And I also think you got to tell people like, what to do like some people just don't know they don't believe they can do these things like they don't i definitely believe there needs to be diversity amongst small businesses no everyone can't be i mean it can't be just everything but then it's hard to squash somebody else's dream but you got to let them know that you can also make money in this like my thing is secondhand clothing i love thrifting i think more black people because Thrift in the second hand economy is a $77 billion projected economy within the next five years. You know who's getting left out of it? Black people. Black people set the trends for everything fashion. I've seen some people in the area doing some great things, but let's not get lit, um, left out of that too. There's many things. So I get it. There definitely needs to be some more diversity. 
And within. Nina, who is the consumers of the secondhand thrifty? It's white people. Yeah. And you why? why? You know why? why? Rich white people are smart. They say, you know what? <laughs> Let all of these lack of financial literacy black folks go into the Gucci store and buy this $300 belt. And when they get rid of it, I'm going to go down here to the thrift store and, repair and put it on. It's a lot of white people, but it's a lot of young kids. It's a lot of one. Uh, it's a lot of young kids, but you know, there's a whole. When I say that, we got to destigmatize our black people from shopping secondhand. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, we grow up in things where we wearing our our brother's clothes, our hand me downs, and you get teased for that. So it's a whole like mental mental shift that we have to make as I a still culture. Shop of people. At Goodwill. Now my son, he he been doing that lately, and I've been like, man, what what you got on, man? I mean, I, and I'm not tripping his thrift. He just ain't got no style with that stuff. Oh, I don't yeah, know. Well, that, well the, Gen Z, P, the Gen Z generation, <laughs> they look different. I'm so, like, I mean. <laughs> no, but, but I think that like that, that's something that, that, that needs to happen. If we, I think that the structural piece, and we look at it from economics, we look at it from education, and we start building from that, I think that we can actually be a much greater community. There is the funds that's there. The black community get a lot of money every single year. Um, our nonprofits, they say they don't, but we do. We get a lot of money and it's just not being spent in the right direction, in my opinion. I think we have to do a little bit more. There is a, um, programs that have amazing impact on young people, but we have to like think bigger than just the 10 people that we actually have, in, have an impact on or those five families that we have impact on. We have to like look at the cookie cutter model at what our oppressors actually did. Like what they actually did was like, they created their wealth by actually supporting each other. Right, when they but gave- Rico, we, we impact when, the same people. You look at the events, the same people are there. Where's the hey John, hey John, look, look, I swear, look, look. I'm, it's funny you said that, look. So I was doing like, I think like six years ago, I was doing promotion, right? And I was taking the class on how to promote online and all that stuff, right? The number one thing that they told me was, do not promote nothing and send it to a friend to promote. Do you know why? You're only recycling the same information because you have the same friends. So when somebody say, you ain't sharing my stuff, Rico, because we have the same 500 friends. Why am I sharing something to the same people? Right? So, but a lot of people, you get the business, you get the business account, and then you promote it, you add $100, you promote it for the whole, for the whole week, and then it's going out to a whole different network that you have nothing to do with. So I, we got to get ready to get out of here. I'm going to just say okay. this. I'm, I'm going to give y'all a solution to the problem. One, we got to teach black professionalism. Okay. First yeah. thing our community needs is black professionalism. We 100%. need to understand how to organize and how to mobilize. We need to learn how to collaborate and work together in partnership. That's the first thing we need to learn, right? Then we need to unlearn, we need to unlearn, not learn, we need to unlearn gatekeeping and oppressing our own people, okay? The next thing we gotta learn is, un unlearn is this thing of competition, all right? Because competition destroys us every time, right? See, this is why Asian community, they thrive, right? Because they can have 10 nail shops on the same block, Rico, right? It could be 10 nail shops on the same block. And you know what? They all gonna keep their prices the same. So it don't matter where you go, the price is the same. Black folks, we go, oh, you can come over here. I can do it for three dollars cheaper. Oh, you we gotta change, we gotta change that model. So those are some of the things that we have to unlearn to really change uh the narrative in our community when it comes to how do we come together, right? The other thing is we gotta come get involved and really care about our people and our children. Okay, because I'm tired of like the only way we get black folks to show up is we got food, okay? I'm tired of the chicken fried wings. I'm tired of the fish fries. I'm just tired of it, okay? I go to these meetings and it's like, okay, we're going to buy fried chicken and we're going to bring collard greens so black folks can show up. This is the mentality of the folks who are leading this stuff. And I said, hey, I'm going to tell you right now, get rid of the food because I want the parents. I don't care how many. I want the parents that care about their kids. All right. I don't want the people that's coming to get some fried chicken and some collard greens. OK, I want the people who really care about their kids. So me, I'm saying a lot of this stuff. We need to just start really being real. OK, because I don't want people just showing up because they go get something. I want the real people who really are passionate about our community, about the people, about our children. And they really want to do this work. It's too much, Rico. You know how it is. Organizing, trying to get people to show up. We got to go to all these extreme measures. 
Sometimes we got to pay people to show up. That's how terrible we become. So I'll be like, do we really care? And I think that's the problem. We've all lost the care and the love to uplift the community. We need to put that back in there. But again, we're so reactive. Okay. And this is our downfall. We need to be proactive. We have to do the preventative stuff so that we're not just reacting stuff. Because as long as we're reacting, we're going to be reacting to the end of time. Education. We got to add an extra day of education so that our young black babies, brown babies get the educational needs that they need from black folks, black history. We can't, we got to stop just teaching about Martin Luther King and, and, and Malcolm X. Okay. We got to, and Rosa Parks. We got to start talking about some of these other phenomenal uh, civil rights leaders and folks that we're going to talk about history. All right. Let's talk about some other folks that did some. I'm tired of the same old people. And this is why I feel like we're only expanding as far as we go on because of what we have inside of us. So all these amazing historians out there, let's try to find some other folks to talk about besides Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Malcolm X, okay, and the Black Panther. Let's talk about some of these other phenomenal Black folks that were freedom fighters and advancing the Black people, okay? And then we got to deal with our organizational leaders like the NAACP and all these phony folks who said it for Black folks and they not. How do we hold them accountable? I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not so impressed with what's going on with these large entities who are sucking the wealth out of black folks and saying that they care about the advancement of black people. All right. And we know it ain't happening. So I'm just going to tell you this poverty pimping. I'm going to say it again. Poverty pimping in our community is at all time high with these extra absorbent corporate folks who say, they invest in black folks. Be careful, black folks, who you're standing by, because I'm just telling you, these folks are extracting everything from our community. So we got a lot of organizational shifts and change that got to happen. Our leadership, you know, the church was the place to learn, Rico. You know, when we came up, now we got all these sophisticated pastoral schools. You know, you can go to school and get a degree in pastoring. I said, Wait a second. I thought the church was the place that we teach. Now you can't even get in the pulpit unless you got this elaborate degree that you went to some theological school and all. Like we got, we got to get real, man. We have corporalized everything. We, we are just. I'm just telling y'all, it, it's terrible right now. We got some terrible stuff going on. We got to fix it. But we are at the end of the time. This surveillance conversation. I knew it was gonna go all the place. Nina got the lady throwing rocks at me already. I'm in trouble now, ladies. I'm sorry, ladies. I didn't mean to go down that rabbit hole. But sisters. Unleash the floodgates. Stop gatekeeping the people. All right? I don't know. But with that being said, we got to get out of here. Before we leave today, uh, Rico, uh, Nina, and Mark, I want you guys to give some pardon ways and any shout outs. Um, but we really need some call to action today to community about getting involved, being organized, and letting their voices be heard. The only way change really happened in our community is people's voices. And I always tell people, your voice is very powerful because when enough people say it, we can slay it, right? You can slay the dragon if enough voices are uplifted. And that's why it's so important for our voices to be uplifted in the community. And it's going to take all of us to do our part, utilize these technology, te technical tools that we have out here to be engaged and involved. Um, because I don't know. I walked City Hall the other day and I'm saying, why? What's going on? We got some problems that we got to do. Because uh, these folks who are in office, uh, they're not in our best interest, Rico. We got supervisors down there locking their doors. Don't want to let people from the community come in their office. I said, what is wrong with people? Okay, but these are the people we put in office. I'm just telling you, we got some issues. Uh, I think Nita said it. 2024, we got some issues. We got to get out and vote. We got to get out and get a part of this process. I think we got to bring education back to our schools on the civil duties, the understanding of government policies. Uh, but people are feeling uh, like, they just in, unpowered. They don't have any power. They don't want to get involved. We just giving up. Black people, we got to get up. Because when we start making noise, the rest of the world start making noise. So just wanted to say that. But Rico, I uh, want to give you a minute to give any part ways, call to action to the community, any shout outs. Thank you again for being here. It's always uh, great uh, to have you here and have these conversations. You know, I, I had somebody call me about the whole Donald Trump conversation that we had three years ago. Oh and they, they, they went back and looked at it. They said, oh, y'all right, because we told them, Rico. I said, what is, this told black, what is this black woman going to do? Now, we wasn't saying that, you know, we just said, what was Kamala Harris going to do? What was Biden going to do? What did we say, Rico? We said, the sad part <laughs> is, because of all the Trump, Trump rhetoric, everybody going to go vote to get him out of office. And I said, watch the social justice movement. They're going to take their foot off the gas. And look what's happening in this country right now. We didn't got comfortable. Soon as Biden got in office, all the rallies stopped. People wasn't involved. Now we reacted. Oh, we got to do something. 
Well, what happened? We got more police, more police incidents right now than before George Floyd with uh, excessive force. I just read an article. The rest of the numbers came out for San Francisco police. San Francisco black people, six less than 6% of black people in San Francisco. And they had 44% of excessive force charges against black people in the city. And we did all that marching across the world about George Floyd. We still don't have a police brutality bill, Rico. All them Democrats standing there with their daishikis on and Nancy Pelosi, Diane Feinstein. Oh, we, we for black people. They up there come by on, on Capitol Hill. And we still don't have a police brutality bill. Tell, black people, wake up. We got to wake up, y'all. We got to stop playing. We got to stop letting these fools pull the rug over our head, y'all. We got to stop it. All this political rhetoric, pay attention. They ain't doing nothing. They just got us on the strings. They just playing the strings, playing the strings, playing the strings. Rico, three years ago, we had that conversation. Everything we said is happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Crazy. But go ahead, Rico. Hey, John, that's the reason why I don't tie myself to one particular party. I, I, I Whatever makes sense for my community, that's what I'm aligning with. It could be Democrat one year. It can be Republican another year. It can be one of their bills versus their bills. Whatever is for our community, that's what I'm with. I ain't tied to nothing. That's a gang. I ain't part of no gang. All right. So uh, I just want to say thank you, John, for having me. It's always a blessing to be on both sides of the conversation. Um, I, I'm truly, it's truly a blessing. Uh, my personal call to action for myself is I'm going to reactivate Black Men United. Um, and I, I wish I can get your help, John, to help support me with that. Um, and, and see if we can get some brothers to at least start something. I know we tried it and tried it, and it was hard to get brothers, but I'm going to try it one more time for the, the big hoorah and see if we can get some uh, brothers. Uh, the next thing is equity. Um, that's my thing is, is, is trying to find equitable resources for the black community. And I, and, and I always say this, equity is already within our community. We don't have to get it from nobody. We already have it there, right? We just got to learn how to push equity. Right. Because when Rico get the opportunity, Rico get that opportunity and think that it's equitable because he have the opportunity. It's just an opportunity for myself. So once I push that equity forward and support another young person or someone who's trying to get into that field, that's when you actually is pushing equity forward. So within our community, we already had an equity. So let's start building up our community on our own. We don't need no support from nobody else. We just got to uplift each other and continue to push our own personal agenda. Thanks, John. Hey, yeah, thanks, Mark. Thank nice meeting you, man. Hey, hey, Rico, thank you for saying that. And, and yes, Black Man United, you you had a vision that, that that was gonna be something huge. And again, to the brothers out there, okay, we gotta do a better job when we say getting involved. Okay, we got too many brothers that just want to do football, basketball, coaching, okay, and rapping and music. We need some black men who are ready to advocate. You know, come to the table, be a part of the rallies, be a car, part of the civil process. Um, because, again, you know, even with the mentorship, Rico, I just see everybody. We want to do the same thing. We need brothers to show up. We need brothers to show up and we need brothers to show up in all kind of capacities. And I'm just tired of it always just being only time you want to see brothers involved is in sports, man. Pop Warner football, basketball, AU. Right. You need that stuff. I'm not saying we don't need it, but I need black men to show up more than just that. Right. I'll be the mentor, but we ain't even mentoring. Right. OK. I'm just saying we need black men to show up in all capacities to help each other. Black fatherhood. Like I said, I'm, I'm still uh, I got to get down there with Elgin Rose. He's doing some phenomenal stuff with the black father group. But we need more of that. We got the black man group going on at the baby. Why? We got other brothers trying to unite. Um, but again. We got to show up, brothers. I mean, I mean, Rico, we just got to get these brothers to show up. Uh, and it can't just be for sports. We got to find more black men in the community that is going to get involved with these community issues because they impact us. And we need the voices of black women. I mean, men and women. But women, I got to say this, Nina, okay? There's something about the power of black men. No matter how much work our women push, when black men come together in unison and our voices are uplifted, the enemy... He has to bow down. Just, it's just what it is. So sisters be open to let the brothers in and give the brothers a leadership role. 
So change can happen. All right, Sister Nita, go ahead, Sister Nita. Give your part in words and your call to action today. You know, I was starting before we leave today. Oh, my God. So all I'm going to say is this. Black men have had the power. Um, they have been in front facing positions. They are the face of the civil rights unions. I mean, the civil rights movement historically. So now fast forward, give the women they flowers. We don't, we, we are taking our moment. We are taking forward, um, you know, and I just want to say, I definitely, I want to say this really quick about the, the timeline thing, about the movement, the social movement. The social movement died way before Biden got into office. Black people have short attention spans. We know this. They stopped four or six months. The NBA came back. Everybody was so happy. Let's go. Um, and I would just like to say my call to action is for everyone to be civically engaged. Like John Henry said, I am a firm believer. Anybody who knows me, I'm staunch in Teach our kids civics. How do we allow our kids to drive? We allow, kids must take a test before they can drive a car, but yet we don't inform them how to use their most powerful tool, the vote. So we need to make sure we are educating this populate um, with the civics messages. And for me, what I plan to do next year is focus on voting, getting the right, um, getting the message out there, because we also as Black people have to realize how to tie what is happening in the city, the positive things to what comes, um, who's sitting in City Hall. So we have to do a better um, job with messaging. So just getting involved, spreading the message and registering people to vote. Definitely. Uh, thank you for being here. I know it's been a while you've been trying to get on I got to invite you back when we have our next relationship conversation. I think it's cuffing season coming up. I think it's time to add a, another relationship. <laughs> we got to add another relationship show in here. It's cuffing season, you know. I, I, I try to stay away from those conversations. A lot of people get mad at me. John, you need to have more relationships because we know that's the biggest problem um, impacting black men and women in our community. We know there's uh, those issues. But, you know, those conversations get very triggering and people, it just, it, you know, I don't know. So I try to spread them out a little bit when we get it close to Valentine's Day and during the holidays. I think I'm going to have to bring you back, Nina, okay? We'll have a, a relationship conversation because I think we got to have there's some people out there still triggered, okay? We got to we gotta heal this trauma in our community when it comes to black women and black man love and brown men and brown women love, okay? Um, but thank you for being here. Your perspective and your uh, information is always on point. Uh, we got a lot of work and I agree with you. We have to do more um, civically and definitely we're just talking to more and more organizations of like, how can we educate our young people about the process and understanding? I'm at a point where I think the only way we'll get young people really involved is we got to drop the voting age to 16. You know, I think we got to get the younger people in and let their voices be heard. And I know a lot of people, no, John, because if these people have all these kids, these kids, go. I say, hey, it's just a process. But um, we got to do it. We got to teach our community. We can't just get involved for the presidential election. We got to get involved with all the local you know, the courts, the DAs and all that stuff as well. So, um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting 2024 with all of the election stuff that's coming up. Um, but again, community, yes, we all have to get involved and make sure we're doing our part. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to working with you again on some other conversations that we're going to have. Uh, so we get more sisters on here. So you're not the only one feeling attacked. Usually Sister Iowa is here. Uh, she's out today, but we'll get you some more uh, women representation and we'll have that Oh, <laughs> that conversation. All right, Brother Mark. I know it's been one of those conversations today. I know you just like, we got to get on cold, Brother Mark. Get the people a call to action. Talk to the people, Mark. I know you, I know these conversations drive you up the wall sometimes. Oh, uh, man. I, only my passion is stirred because I love my people so much. Um, first of all, let, let me just say thank you, Brother Rico. Mad respect to you, brother. It's an absolute honor, privilege just to conversate with you. Uh, Sister Nina, absolute queen. Love the fire, love the passion, love the way you think. Um, again, we're not all going to agree eye to eye, but I think if we can be heart to heart on, on our love and commitment to our people, everybody has a role to play, so I'm glad for that. Um, community, um, not even being attached to surveillance. I just kind of want to speak to, to our mindset as a people. Um, and I'm thinking about current events and, and, and the past historical event, because sister Nina alluded to something earlier about uh, what happened to our community back in the eighties in particular and through the nineties. Um, our community has been decimated, like literally um, psychologically, physically, economically, um, and, and as I'm looking at a, a source of 
where we're at historically as a people, and where can we draw inspiration from? And I, I see what's happening right now. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa, you, you have uh, you have nations like Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Nigeria, uh, Niger. They're all starting to reassert their own independence and kick out all the people who've govern them and rob them of their resources for years and they're starting to turn to the young people to lead and guide them to rebuild and have a brighter future for africa as a continent and because as our community that's where we draw our roots from i look to that as inspiration but i also want to kind of put more historical context on it if you think about japan after world war ii when, when the atomic bombs went off in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people being killed instantly. And when a nation goes through that kind of tr trauma and devastation, it's a miracle when you saw what Japan was able to do as a people and how they were able to rebuild. And again, I would encourage anybody, go go look at a documentary of how Japan rebuilt their society where they actually sat down and decided that the next generation, they were going to have so many people that were going to go into engineering, so many people that were going to go into medicine, so many people that were going to go into, like, as a community, we have to stop having such a laissez-faire attitude about what our children are going to be put in front of. We need to, if we're going to give them the opportunity to build a better future, we're going to have to give them some structure, some guidance, and a plan that is true to who we are and our African roots. So community, I just want to encourage you. There is a real opportunity in all the chaos we see to reemerge more healed, more empowered, and more unified. And that's what I hope we can do with both sides of the conversation. Man, very powerful stuff, Mark. Thanks uh, for giving that. The voice have spoken. You heard the reason from the voice. Now, I am the bishop. I have to give the benediction before we get out of here today because I got to call action. I'm just going to say what it is. They don't, I don't care if y'all don't like my radical benedictions, okay? But my call to action, all right, is going to be powerful because I'm tired of playing around, okay? So my benediction is going like this tonight. Community, wake up. Stop pressing the snooze button on the alarm, okay? You know that alarm that goes off in the morning, Mark, when you don't want to get up and go to work? And, beep, 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 and you hit the snooze, okay? Community, we got to stop hitting the snooze button. There's an alarm going on in our community, around us, globally, locally. We are being impacted. Human rights are being violated globally, locally. We have a right to our privacy. We have a right to understand the very entity, the very private sector, public sector, that are surveillance in our community. It is our job to hold those folks accountable. It is our job, community, to ask the question, not be afraid to say, oh, it's just there. And that's what it's supposed to be. It is our job as community leaders to call the action, to hold people accountable, ask the question so that we can make the change. Surveillance is a big, big, big entity. There's a lot of things happening in surveillance. I'm not here to say, take down all of the cameras. That's not what I'm here to say. I'm here for accountability. I need my community to understand what's going on. We need better education. We need better awareness. We need a better oversight to understand what's going on so that we can make the right judgment decision. Do we need surveillance in our camera or we don't? It is time for us to mobilize. We are headed in to the next election season. We must get activated. We must get involved. We must find a way to understand the processes, the bills, the goals, the laws, so that we can have our voice to make sure that we are part of the chain. We can't just sit back no longer and say, well, whatever happened, they're going to do it anyway. No, today is the new day. Today, I am calling out the community to stand together in unity, to stand together to hold the people that are standing behind us accountable. We can't just give them a free key to our unfreedom. We cannot give them the access to just disturb and disrupt our lives because they have the resources, because they have the titles and they have the positions to do it. It is our job to make sure that there's a fair playing field. It is our job to protect our children, our families and our community. So many things can happen 
when folks become bigger than the agenda. So many times there are leaders who are leading with power and ego and not looking out for the holistic healing of our community. We must make sure that those folks are accountable. We will continue to keep an eye shining bright on the cameras that are watching our community. I don't know. I'm going to keep pushing along. Walk with me. Stand with me. Continue to follow the movement. We must move and unite. They say the revolution won't be televised. I despise. I say today we must televise our revolution if we want to make change. Our community is hurting more than ever. We need grace and humility when dealing with the issues that impact our community. But we also need activation. Today is the day. Do not hit snooze anymore, community. We must get up. We must deal with the noise that is irritating us to get up. Stand up, community. We must do this in unity together. With that being said, thank you all for tuning in to this Sunday's conversation. It's been interesting. It's taken a lot of turns, but we are here to continue to intentionalize and make sure that the community understands what's going on. We have a problem that we must address. We must step together. We must lead together. Rico gave it out there. There's a lot of things that we need to do. We need those structures in place. We need those foundations. We can't move, do anything without a solid foundation. That's why I'm not a square. I am a triangle, okay? I always tell people I am a triangle, okay? I have a strong foundation and I'm sharp on the top. Community, we need more triangles. Let's get involved. Get out there and vote this 2024, all right? With that being said, thank you all for tuning in. Our next live show is this Tuesday. We're going to have Brother Rodney uh, from the uh, Baco, uh, um company come on to talk about their upcoming play and uh, things that they're doing. And then Thursday, we'll have another educational Thursday. And then next week, it is Veterans Day, and we'll start dealing with some of the veteran conversations, what's going on. We'll be talking about man health, number of things this month. And then we got Thanksgiving coming up. So I don't know. We'll have a couple of shows. We'll be out in the community trying to impact those families in need. Maybe we'll be at New Beginnings. I don't know. We'll be somewhere helping to bless the people because we know this holiday season, it will be a challenge for a lot of our black and brown families. As we just saw today, PG e is asking to increase PG e bills by 22% here in California. OK, right at the time where time is going back hour. I hope everybody cut their class back an hour today as well, because, I, you know, I was confused. I see the clock. At 130. What's going on? All right. Make sure you check your clocks in your house and turn them back an hour. Um, but the weather is getting cold. We had light rain today. It's getting colder out there, community, as we get close to these holidays and these uh, late winter months. Folks are going to need support, so make sure you're doing your part. We'll start putting up uh, <clears throat> the next couple of shows moving forward, some of the foundations, some of the organizations um, that are taking clothing, clothes, so that we know how to give uh, hoodies and coats and things that some of our unhoused family and children will need those supports um, this winter season. Um, we got the DA coming on here, one of these educational Thursdays soon. I don't know, Sister Brooks, I need you to come on. I got some questions about this surveillance. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we We'll, we'll be having uh, D.A. Brooks coming on in a couple weeks here. Uh, we'll talk to her about this surveillance stuff. I don't know, Rico. I got to ask her. You know, they they got these cameras up, and they don't have these signs up. How can they be convicting people with these cameras? I don't know. I'm going to ask her. I don't know. She'll give me a brilliant answer. Hey, but with that being said, community, thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you for watching. Nina, Rico, thank you for being here. Two powerful community leaders stepping up, letting their voices heard, be heard and their perspective. And again, I am the Bishop. We love you here at both sides of the conversation to our amazing team. Thank you all for the amazing stuff you do together. We can change the narrative and we will do it by uplifting the voices of the people. See y'all all on our next live stream on Tuesday. Have a blessed evening. Good night now, community.